We'll call to order this work session for Thursday, May 5th. Uh, before we begin, I want to let you know Commissioner Seal will not be joining us. Uh, she is out today. Uh, Commissioner Peters is not joining us today. She had a personal uh, conflict. And I think we have everybody else, so we're ready to go. Good morning, Mr. Administrator. Take us away. Good morning, Commissioner. So we have another full agenda today. We'll start off first um, with the Cross Bay Ferry renewal discussion. And I have Jill Silverboard, Deputy Administrator, that's going to provide the presentation. Good morning, Commissioners. Make sure I can use the clicker. We have a brief slide deck this morning just to provide you with an update on our four-year agreement that's among Hillsborough County, uh, Pinellas County, and the cities of St. Petersburg and Tampa for the Cross Bay Ferry inner city service. You asked us to come back um, prior to the annual notification provision in the agreement, which is June the 1st. And so we're here to give you a report on what we know about the season that just ended and uh, answer any questions that you have. We'll move through this pretty quickly. Um, just want to point out a couple of things up front is that we are using data that was provided by HMS. They've been great about that all year. Um, we do not have a presentation that is updated through the ridership of this past weekend. I'll give you that number, but it's we had to complete this, of course, before May 1st. Um, so we, you know, we, we have April data now, but it's not reflected in this presentation. So your existing, this slide reflects just a recap of your existing agreement, uh, which is proposed to be a four-year um, arrangement with every year adding one month of service until we reach 12 months of service in the fourth year. Uh, subsidy amounts are equal per county and per city uh, participant. And we have noted, as we did when you agree, uh, approved this agreement last year, that the DOT um, funding that was previously provided has, has expired, but Hillsborough County has applied for uh, DOT funding that could change the, the number of participants and bring down uh, the per government cost. <clears throat> Go to the next slide, please. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Ah, there we go. So who rode the ferry? Uh, this slide shows you what we know about where riders came from in the season that just ended this past weekend. Uh, the chart on the left reflects um, where Cross Bay Ferry riders preside based upon zip code data. And you can, you can see we reflect that's about 43% of Pinellas County residents. For the pie chart on the left, uh, what I do want to point out is the tourist category. We created that from uh, anyone who rode the ferry that was not from the greater Tampa Bay area. So they could be a domestic or an international, you know, we don't know, but that's, they're not Tampa Bay residents. They're not in Hillsborough, they're not in Pinellas, and uh, wanted to make sure we explained that. The chart on the right looks at rider origins. Uh, where did they come from? And um, basically, in this case, uh, you can see again, Pinellas County uh, actually has 58% of the ridership for this past season. And um, it's not noted, it, but- no, Jill, it was, so of the 43%, 58% are St. Petersburg. Yeah, I was going to that slide. Yeah, 58% St. Petersburg. We are, uh, unincorporated is one of those orange slices, I mean, one of the purple slices on the pie to the right. We're about 11%. Um, and as Barry said, the St. Petersburg of that Pinellas percentage is, is, the, is the biggest percentage. So um, HMS did some passenger surveys and provided us with some data. Um, that's what this slide is, is providing you, is just some idea of um, what the trends looked like. Obviously, far and away, the majority of trips are weekend. We knew that. We talked about that last year that, and expected that to be the case. Um, the survey data that was provided indicated that the riders' destinations were um, dining was the largest percentage museum and entertainment venues, shopping, sporting events um, was about 13%, and then another 12% was just for walking around, I guess, taking in the sites, uh, not a specific destination. 
So the seasonal ridership and revenue, um, this is just giving you a comparison to the historical data, your previous three-year agreement and the pilot season. And obviously you can see both ridership and the revenues are trending up uh, by the orange line and the, and the blue uh, column. I, again, I wanna point out that we're using a total for 21-22 on this slide of 49,160. The actual total was gonna be over 60,000. Um, April was a very uh, heavy month for the ridership but this gives you some perspective. So basically it's going to be the best year that we have seen um, since uh, the beginning of the pilot. We calculated the government partner subsidy. So each of us again pay equally the four governments uh, into this. We took that number and uh, the total ridership mathematical formula here, but you can see that the uh, rider subsidy cost per rider that's reflected of $14.24 is less than uh, last year. But again, that number will go down even a little further when we update the total riders, uh, that, which will be over 60,000. So that, that subsidy per rider number will come down just a little bit. So we did a forecast model for you. Um, we have on the top um, a graph that shows based upon the average ticket and what we understand HMS projects to be a $2 increase per ticket for the remaining three years. We know what our subsidy amounts um, in the agreement are and then what that reflects to um, the HMS in terms of profit or loss. Now, the bottom model is a model that we created saying if there is no government subsidy in the coming three years, and what would be the average ticket price that would allow HMS to have a profit? So that's why our, in our version, the ticket price stays at 1175. So that would keep it under the $12 uh, in the agreement, um, and it would allow for a profit uh, but with no subsidy from any of the four of us. So that's a, a forecast consideration. In the last slide, um, before we get to any of your questions, you had asked us to specifically take a look at the availability of tourist development tax as a funding mechanism. Um, we have met with the county attorney's office. We've discussed this with our CVB team, and it is a possible yes but very complicated um, and you know we we don't think that that's a source that you can look to for the cross bay ferry uh, is the is the general conclusion did you want to you want to jump in well uh, it, on the tourism development tax solely um, on the advertising and sponsorship now we did not make progress there there was a real lack of interest in uh, pursuing advertising and opportunities there um, but I think there's still more that can be done with that. Um, but I do believe that CVB could be a partner in that advertising. You know, you had mentioned wrapping the boat or, you know, whatever, and I understand these are rental boats. So we'd have to have those discussions. But I think there's some, you know, and it's in the, you know, $25,000 range of value, the way CVB calculates that. Um, but I'd also like to see, you know, um, the, um, you know, Hillsborough, Tampa, CVB, you know, uh, partner the same way. Um, but, but so there's some opportunities there. The other piece that I, I guess, you know, is that the last slide? Uh, yeah, I, I was going to update them on HMF's efforts for the sponsorships too. When you okay, so, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. And the last piece on this slide is that the, there's concessions and private chartership revenue. I don't think it's a lot, um, but again, that's not part of our agreement, you know, and I think that that's an open opportunity to be able to re-look at the agreement and see if there's a better way to structure this. Um, and you know, and, that, and that's really the bottom line. You know, as, as you know, you have a notification requirement. We entered into the contract last year that we read about in the paper had, had being approved across the bay. And you know, that's not the right way to do this. And, I, and looking at this, I think there's an opportunity to restructure the agreement. However, to, to do that, you have to provide notification by June 1st um, of our intent to um, withdraw from the agreement. If we do that, we, uh, you don't have to have a new agreement in place until August 1st um, for the new season. So we have an opportunity and a window uh, to set down and put these things on the table and structure an agreement. I had a conversation with John Bennett yesterday 
um, about you know those types of things, you know, and I, I think there's at least interest in and in having a more um, coordinated and uh, collaborative discussion about a uh, new agreement. There was, um, Commissioner, I just wanted to share, there is one PS that HMS provided us, and they have actually um, been working with a consultant about developing sponsorship and uh, marketing programs for the service that we, that you had asked them to do last year. So that'd be part of what uh, the administrator's talking about. And we did confirm that the concessions go to the boat owner, not to HMS. So there aren't, they are not part of our revenue manual, and they've told us that the charter, they, that they didn't run any charters, so there's no charter revenue that's reflected okay. in the analysis. They still can. They can run charters per the agreement, but they're saying they did not. Okay. Um, we do have uh, technical staff here, but Barry really took you to the decision point. We're happy to answer any questions. Could you go back one slide? Sure, maybe. To the forecast models? Yes. And in the, the top part, under their model, their forecast model that they provided us, um, that we don't have a projection of how many folks are writing, but I assume that's baked into the uh, money somewhere. It, it at, is. Yeah. The, the profit loss line, what, what out of that dollar amount on the far right column, what percent do the individual governments get returned to them? So for the season that just concluded, we think we may see between six and eight thousand dollars per partner. Six to eight thousand. Mm -hmm. So that would be. Yeah, no. Is that right? No. Uh, hang on one second, Brent. Is that no. correct? No, it's more than that. No, six to eight. I think I'm no. Yeah. Well, like somebody three. who knows the answer, Four. we need to. My notes say. I'm sorry. My notes say we're projected to receive a refund of eight to nine thousand. Let's get Brent to give that. I think yeah. the number's higher. Um, All right. Um, and so under your model, the their projection was to charge $11.16 a ticket. Your model is $11.75 a ticket. Right. So, uh, but, but no, they have a cap in their agreement of how much per 12, ticket. Twelve dollars. Twelve. So they have a they have within the agreement twelve. They were charging ten dollars, though, correct? That, that average average was ten for the season that just ended. And so they, these are their projections for the, average ticket. Right. I was going to say in their projection it shows up to fifteen dollars in twenty four. It would require an agreement. It would uh, require modification. a modification to the agreement to be able to do that. And they have an average ticket price. Remember, they charge differently for like a lightning game than you know a regular Friday uh, night or whatever. And so there's a uh, so just to kind of break it down to the bottom line for what is that uh, 59 cent difference per ticket in this year's model? You could eliminate the entire government subsidy, and they would have a profit of nine thousand dollars. That's that's our model. Yes. Okay. Um, and we backed into that amount of 1175 in order to achieve a profit. So that's where the number came from. Okay. And that's where I think if we, add, if we just do a basic job of um, sponsorship, you know, with advertising, um, that builds in a, a, a cushion that could easily make these, um, this type of model work. But, those, but we need further discussion with them. Okay. Uh, before we hear from anyone else questions, Commissioner Gerard. Well, just comment. I'm not. I can't imagine why they would want to do it to to get that kind of profit. <laughs> I mean, for nine thousand or fifty six thousand, even that's not a whole lot for that operation. So, yeah, if there's other ways that we can help them make a profit, that would be great. But yeah. right now, the agreement specifies that any any money that they were any. Re money that is made, uh, there's a 50% revenue sharing provision and they rebate back to the four local governments after their annual revenues meet $400,000. And I have a corrected number for you. So the uh, estimated rebate per partner is $30,000. That's an important figure. So Barry's right, it's a higher number. Yeah. And that was on the this current 2122? Yes, yes, and is that with the final numbers or are the numbers through March? Yes. Yeah. So, okay. Okay, so it would actually go down below 30,000 a little bit because they're right. making more money on the April month. Commissioner Flowers. 
I was also um, uh, doing um, Lewis. Um, I would have to say that, thank you, it's not connecting to the office. I would have to say that um, I do support anything that we can do to tie in with our Convention and Visitors Bureau um, to advertise. When we're looking at the utilization of um, waterborne transportation, period, the whole scheme, everybody that's coming, this is one of those methodologies, and I would think we would want to advertise mm -hmm. um, in order to make sure that people knew that this resource is available um, and to utilize it, whether you're utilizing it for work or for extracurricular activities. Um, I would love to see that connection made because I think it fits perfectly. Um, so that's the first, that's my two cents there. For the, um, I didn't recall the concession piece as a part of the discussion when we had conversations before. Well, it, it, it's never, it's, it's not part of the agreement. It was never so part it was of never the included in that. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't, we haven't had that discussion. I don't know how much you know revenue that is, um, and I and I agree with you know uh, Commissioner Gerard that you know the, the company has to make a profit. So there's so we I just sent, saying there's a piece there that we we want to have a discussion about, um, you know, and try to make it work, you know, for everyone. Um, where are they with additional boats? I know we talked about that. Um, well, they've um, there's a grant that they've applied for to, or, and I think it's been approved for yes. one additional boat. Um, that is, has to be constructed, and it's about four years out, you know, so um, dependent upon how long it takes and all those things. You know, so. It's not estimated to be in service for the balance of this agreement, but they hope, okay. to, they hope that it might be. But pessimistically, we would say we don't expect it to be here for the Because I was going to say if, in fact, it was put in place in service, we could um, mm -hmm. probably close that time by half um, in seeing a positive revenue source. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Long. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was curious, Jill, if there have been any conversations at all with T. Barta, uh, only because this ferry crosses county lines, and it seems to me that they are in a prime position to pull federal dollars down to help us in some way. I don't know what, but I thought it would be worth a conversation. They actually um, are aware of and participated <clears throat> with Hillsborough County and in making the grant application for the federal dollars. Okay. Well, I, if I could follow. Yes, ma'am. I didn't hear anything at all in your presentation that spoke to any progress or conversation or research that's being done in order to electrify these boats. I keep hearing that we're not there yet, the technology isn't there, but I've read other articles that state that the technology is there. And I'd be curious about whether or not our county staff has had any of those conversations. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> other than what you just stated, Commissioner, the answer is no, we, we haven't. Um, we've been focused on trying to secure the new boat under the, uh, the federal grant and its impact on this agreement, but we as you understand that the technology is still evolving. But again, the, we the, the lead it. on this has been Hillsborough County, yeah. not Pinellas County staff. Yeah. So they, they negotiated, applied for, um, that was solely on that side of the bay. I really? will say that it was the existence of the Cross Bay Ferry Service, though, that assisted in that <laughs> grant being qualified. That is true. That's, I mean, that's an important point. Other questions? Commissioner Eggers. I just want to make sure that I'm clear. Um, there's two different, there's two models there, and there's not much difference in the ticket price, and we're talking about a substantial difference in the profit. So, is there anything else that doesn't meet the eye that makes the picture that different? Um, so, so the model is based on the same assumptions. Well, one, until we sit down and, and look at the agreement, 
um, and we're you know parties at the table, then I can't answer that question. Oh, yeah. What I'm trying to show you is that with a slight increase in, in ticket price and potentially increasing the advertising and, and things like that, that we believe it's our assumption that this can be run without a subsidy. Um, and so, but in order to affect that and get parties to the table, of which, you know, won't occur without us taking an action, which is to make a notification to terminate the agreement uh, by July for, or June 1st, which is required. But you don't have to have a new agreement in place until August. So it gives us time to sit down and try to work on a new agreement that we can all live with. And I, and I certainly, I certainly would support that completely. I do the, the comment that Commissioner Flowers made about exploring other opportunities, especially with regards to the advertising, would be great. But I certainly would prefer giving notice to get out of the agreement. Um, uh, I've not been a big proponent of it to begin with. But when you talk about those kind of numbers, it so, sort of tells the story about, you know. I guess government's role in bridging to a point where it's a break even. And at least I'm seeing that from our model. Uh, certainly we'd like to give staff some time to, to kind of go through that and see, see what other things we can consider before we re-up, so to speak, in August. So I would definitely want to go, move forward with uh, terminating the current agreement. Anyone else? Jill, was that it? Right. Yes, sir, that was it. I, I do want to just say again that we used HMS data, but we did create our own analysis as well. So as Barry says, you know, we, we can go back and talk, um, but I would say that I think they've had the most successful season, and that cuts both ways. You know, I just, just end on this, that this is a, this is a very popular service, you know, for the portion of our county that uses it, and, and that's a good thing, you know. And we have a lot of very good things around the county that, but that don't require necessarily a subsidy. Um, there are certain things. When this was originally sold, remember, it was a transportation issue, okay? It was people to work, and we found out that it's not people to work. It's entertainment, and, and that's a good thing for our economy. I mean, it's, I think this, we, we, there's a, what we're really trying to show is there's a way of making this work just in a modified structure. And I think that that's what we're asking the time to pursue. I don't want anyone to believe that we don't believe this is a, a valuable thing that our residents um, um, really want. And, and, I, and I know Hillsborough you know, feels the same way. I think there's a way of doing this now that we, the idea of a subsidy was to kind of get them up and running. Well, now, now they're up and running. They're having their best season ever. I think a mod, slight modifications to the agreement can allow it to continue um, without um, other taxpayers subsidizing it. Commissioner Long. Yes, there are I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, I support the ferry and the concept of the ferry. That said, I am very focused on the future and how it impacts not only our, our transportation initiatives, but our climate and our environment. And I am sorry to say, I will not support this if you can't come back to us and, you know, as we move forward with some kind of a document or a report that signals that we are working towards electrification of these vehicles. I don't know everything about the infrastructure monies that are available, but I do know there's a whole section in there that relates to ferries for public transportation. And given how focused this administration has been on electrification of public transportation, I cannot believe that somewhere there isn't something going on to fulfill that need, especially when the money is there to pull it down. And secondly, um, I had another point and I forgot to write it down, so it's gone right out of my <laughs> mind, but I will, I will remember it, and I'll come back, and if it's not during this meeting, it will be in a follow-up. I think the ferry is just one tool in our toolbox that is sorely needed, and it has been incredibly successful uh, across our country in other areas and around the world. I mean, let's be honest. The, I did just remember what it was. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, I want, and I don't know how anybody else feels, but I do believe that if we were doing it right and we had enough of the, of the vessels, that it could be an option for public transportation to get back and forth to work. And I don't understand why that isn't on the table. When the idea of the ferry was first brought to me, there was a lot of talk about how that would alleviate cars on our roads. And suddenly, now that we're in it and we're up to our eyebrows in it, all of a sudden that's off the table. I don't think that's good enough. I heard you, Jill, and this isn't about you, and I'm not mad at anybody, even though my you know, passion gets in the way. I did hear you use the word aspirational when you first made the presentation to us a year ago. And there's nothing aspirational in this, in my mind, if we're not looking at public transportation to get people back and forth in a timely manner, to and fro, to go to work, and if we're not focused on electrifying these boats. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner, if I can respond. That the aspirational term was not used by us, but it was coming out of the um, discussions with HMS. Okay, regarding that, because it was the Tampa to West Shore piece, which was originally proposed, and that sh quickly shifted, and now there is nothing within this four-year agreement that has anything to do with West Shore. Um, now, they have focused over on, and that's part of uh, applying for that boat, which is to get to South Tampa, and that would be a weekday service, and that would be, you know, to uh, ad address that, and they have to set up a different model for that, obviously, because... People are going to pay more because, you know, if they go uh, to not have to go to the Lightning Game and pay 35 bucks for parking, um, you know, then if you're going to do it every single day, you know, for commuting back and forth to the office. Are you talking Apollo Beach to, to downtown? Is that Where, wherever the south is Mc, it? McDill to Mc, South Is it McDill? Tampa. Yeah, mm -hmm. McDill to South Tampa. And so you've got a captive audience there. And that, so that's a, that's a, the prime piece of the, of the application would be to, to use it for that purpose and also then for the cross bay you know service um, outside of that and so that's what they're building out to and i and i that addresses transportation that is a real transportation issue um but it's but it's a captive audience and and our agreement only requires one trip per day um so you know the existing agreement doesn't address and commissioner long's points are well well made and well noted but but this agreement that's not as barry said that's not where we're at at the moment. Right, that was an adjustment after the, the initial year where there was Monday to Friday mm -hmm. and it really wasn't successful as much as the, especially comparison to the weekend. Well, there, it, the agreement still requires them to do the one trip per day. What we know though is that far and away the mass, vast majority of trips occur on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So during the current season, they're going seven days a week? I, it's my understanding that they are required to run one per day I didn't. I didn't think it was a Monday through Sunday, seven day a week on this on this model. I thought that was a ramp up kind of thing. What is it? Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Thirty-two trips. Thirty. said thirty-two trips a week. Thirty-two so trips a Thursday week. Thursday through Sunday. So that's it's even. I, so it's not even as. It's that's not, what I. That's I that what was I not as as I stated. So it's not that optimistic. Commissioner Long. Well, yes, I'm. Lis I'm listening with great um, interest on the conversation that we've just heard in the last two minutes, because it's all about Hillsborough County and their agreement. This agreement we're talking about now, unless I'm totally mistaken, is for a four-year contract. Is that right? You just concluded you, the first year of the four year. years. Last okay, year. Okay, so for three more years? Last year, we entered into an agreement because, again, it came to us last minute, and we entered into it, and we said, what well, we want to see, we, we want to see how this is going to work. And so as part of entering to that agreement, which you know you agreed to, and we said, well, then we'll look at these other issues. Um, and so now we're coming up to that point where if we're gonna terminate this agreement, if we wanna make modifications, we need to terminate this agreement to negotiate a new agreement. And that notification period is no later than June 1st. And so that's the reason we're asking so we can go back and look at modifications that I think are necessary. So I don't think, I mean, we're talking about going forward for the next three years, right? No, I'm, I'm talking about entering into a new agreement that are but, terms that we all agree to. 
Yes, but for three years. For whatever term it could be, it, yes. It could well, be three years. We're in the end of the be. first year of a four-year contract. Yeah. If we want to change any of the terms, ticket price, subsidy, requirement of trips, anything that we want to, if we want to change anything, we basically have to start over because it's interlocal with the four okay, government Okay, but entities. I'm with Dave Eggers because I think we need to amend the contract ASAP. And we need more than, you know, once a day, in my mind. We're going to subsidize it. Commissioner Eggers. Uh, yeah, uh, Barry made a couple of comments that I just wanted to piggyback on, and that is that I think it's important to note that this service has a place in t the Tampa Bay area, no question about it. And so when I, when I make my comments about, you know, let's explore other alternatives, it's within the context that this is a, a good thing for the area. But I also wanted to note that we have had some other discussions at the MPO a little bit here, but on other waterborne transportation initiatives and, and what the, that area might need to prop them up to get them started. And I think that's another piece of this whole waterborne transportation thing that's going on. So hopefully, as we, if we choose to kind of open this up again over the next two to three months and take a look at the agreement, we can also kind of see what else is going on on the other, get, kind of get an update on what's going on on the other front. Because I'd like to make sure that we're kind of addressing and both of them in unison. I was interesting that you said, somebody said that there's that very unlikely that TDC funds would be available, which I find, because I've been asking for four years now uh, if there's any tie to tourism. And I'm seeing from this that we're almost 19, 20% of the riders are tourism based. No, yes, or is that? A tie to tourism <coughs> it's, is not necessarily the criteria though in the, <coughs> the rules about what you can spend money on. The advertising, we could certainly advertise, okay. we could spend okay. advertising dollars on the boat if we wanted, but it's not a museum, aquarium, baseball stadium, yeah. that kind of thing. We, we went to great um, d lengths of discussion <laughs> regarding the um, limitations under the use of the TDC funds, and it's, and it's pretty tight. Unless um, you were maybe tying into, I mean, it goes to the convention center, other... Other CVBs use funding for transportation within a convention center. I mean, you'd, you'd have to really kind of stretch it yeah, into. It's convention center to the hotels, though. Right. It's very, very specific. You okay. can tie so, it back to tourist, um, you know, and and so okay. you know, we we've looked at this because especially for other types of waterborne transportation, I was yeah. very interested in like the boats and some of the capital infrastructure and stuff. Right. And we just can't get there, and you know, and that's the um, and that's reading you know the letter of the law and, and trying to apply it because. Uh, it would have been very, very helpful to have a, a more broad um, okay. interpretation of that rule uh, for all of us. <laughs> okay, so, they're, 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 so getting back to the advertising piece of it might might work. Okay, well, in any event, I'm 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 interested in looking at a, a new agreement. I'm also interested in getting context with the other efforts that we've been talking about with waterborne along the intercoastal, kind of getting mm -hmm. an update on that as well. So, thank you, Attorney White. Did you? Want to weigh in? Well, I, and let me just add to um, as far as convention centers goes, the one example that we're aware of, it is internal to the convention center itself. It is not back and forth between the convention center and the airport or the convention center and hotels. It is parking in the convention center on the convention center grounds to the actual bill in its Orange County. I mean, if any of you are familiar with that convention center, it is gigantic. <laughs> So it makes you know perfect sense to have those. That's the example we are aware of that relates to convention centers. All right, um, before, uh, Commissioner Jordan. Yeah, I guess I'm, I don't know how much we're going to accomplish in two months in terms of getting answers to these questions that we've had for a year. Uh, and I think on us this time, we've waited until we absolutely have to make a decision this week that's and we don't have any answers. Well, and, and the answers, though, have to come. I mean, if we're talking so about for, TDC so gonna, money, then it has to be our answer, not theirs. So if we're going to uh, put this out, I mean, the only way that we're going to be able to renegotiate this contract is to provide a termination notice. I understand uh, that. Otherwise, but I wish we otherwise, had, I wish we had done. I wish we had had this discussion earlier and actually had something to talk about because right now we don't well we, we have nothing and we intentionally waited to have numbers from the season that just ended 
And so, yes, it does, it does compress the window, oh. but it, we, otherwise we would have been looking at what the last few years of the last three year agreement, and that was impacted by COVID. So, you know, we were trying to allow us and HMS and the other partners enough time to really see what, what it was looking like. I mean, do we have any clue what, <laughs> so what are we pursuing? If we, if we say no to this agreement right now, what are we pursuing? Modifications to the agreement. And to, if you, in, what, to what? Um, price. What modifications? Okay, so um, agreements on price. Okay, what, what we're charging. We can look at the advertising piece. Okay, we can factor that in. We can understand the issues of how, how they make a profit, how do they operate, and what are those concessions. Um, so we can, we can look at a model and, and use the current agreement and modifications to that agreement to try to come up with an agreement that works for us. Um, I, I think there's minor modifications that can occur, um, but there hasn't been interest in opening up the agreement. Um, and I think that this action will enable us to be able to negotiate a modification to the agreement. Absent that, I don't think the staff can. Barry, I want to add one oh, PS to that as uh, Hillsborough County reports that they hope to know if DOT will become a funder for the balance of the agreement by the end of June. Okay, well, that's helpful. Um, and does that impacts our subsidy? Yeah, um, the idea that we've seen would be to go to five partners, five funders. But well, we gotta see how four. much that is. If they're an equal right. partner or are they just giving us 50,000, you know, annually or whatever. But all that can be factored in. And we're gonna factor in the advertising revenue. Um, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you. So I, I just want clarification. Even if we, even if they wanted to increase the amount of their fare, which is a part of what they're asking, we still would have to um, renegotiate this contract, even if that was all that we did. That I'm asking, just asking. I, I and again, I don't want to. I don't want to try to speak on behalf of HMS. We're trying to <clears throat> answer your questions based upon what they've provided. Those were their projections for average ticket price um, that you saw. So it was a, it, it's their projection for average t average ticket saw, ticket cost. And yes, it goes above the current agreement maximum of twelve dollars in their model. But I guess what I'm asking is if they decided, they decided. to increase their, their ticket price or whatever, which yep. I have no problem with increasing based on the cost of goods and services, fuel, et cetera. Um, what the question I'm asking is, according to the contract, they would have to come back to us to negotiate that or that's something that yes. they could do anyway. They, if, it, if it went above the average ticket price per the agreement, then the agreement would have to be modified for, for all four parties. Now that okay. isn't projected until out in 24 or something. So they, you know, but, but here it would provide us an opportunity to make those adjustments as part of this. Okay. Um, and, you know, in terms of timing, you know, um, and Brent and them are here in the audience. They're, they've taken the lead, you know, for on our behalf uh, on this. We can get started on this tomorrow. We're at May, we're in the early part of May. We have three months, you know, in which to come up with uh, modifications before, you know, we, we run into any type of issues. If we have no further questions for staff, we, I do want the opportunity, we do have representatives uh, from, uh, from the uh, ferry if you have questions for them. All right. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. The next item, commissioners, is a presentation on um, Pinellas Trail access and standards. If you recall back, we had some discussions, I don't know, about a year ago regarding uh, when somebody can access it, whether it's uh, you know two guys in a hammer building a bridge or whether it's uh, engineered plans. And they've really went back and looked at our policies regarding our trail and our access and tried to come up with some standards. Um, and so Lyle Fowler, who is our operations <coughs> manager at Parks, is going to provide um, a presentation on what they've looked at and kind of um, some recommendations where to go forward. Go ahead, Lyle. Thank you, Barry. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Lyle Fowler. I'm an operations manager on staff with the Parks and Conservation Resources Department, and I'll provide you the update today. Just as a piece of trivia, before I move off of this slide, uh, our most recent connection to the trail is there in the picture. 
that's the Alta uh, Bel, Bel Air apartment complex um, on the south section of the Pinellas Trail. Do we just push it? Okay. All right. Moving into the recap. Um, back in May of 2021, Paul Kazi presented uh, to the board the three types of connections that exist on the trail today, uh, being commercial, residential, and municipal. Uh, the map there to the right uh, depicts the distribution of those, those connections today, uh, with the commercial at the top being 28. You'll, you'll notice on the map that um, it is the Fred Marquis Pinellas Trail proper, which is the portion of the trail on the western edge of the county. Uh, there are not sections of the Duke Energy Trail because the county doesn't technically have ownership of it. It's through a use agreement. Um, moving on to direction that we believe we received as a result of the uh, work session a year ago. Um, we understood that the board expressed a desire to facilitate commercial connections when appropriate for enhanced community and public enjoyment. Um, we also took from that meeting that private residential connections would not be considered because they did not meet the public purpose test, uh, which is highlighted in the uh, transfer agreement from the state of Florida to Pinellas County, which provides us ownership of the trail. Um, lastly, municipal connections, of which there are, are many, uh, those will continue to be handled on a case-by-case case, case case basis with all of our municipal partners. Just to illustrate some examples, moving from left to right, uh, we have the uh, municipal connection, which is near the West Bay Overpass, uh, partnership with Largo. We have the Cobb Movie Theater, uh, which is at the Tyrone Mall. And then we have a residential example, uh, you can see by comparison of the photos that the two to the left um, fully meet a commercial standard of public use. And the one on the right is more of a residential grade and is certainly intended for one-way traffic, meaning the, the, land, the property owner can access the trail, but it's not intended to provide uh, trail users access to private property. That, that's from one individual residence? Yes. I'm not sure the exact location, but that is... Uh, it, it's representative of some of the ones you see. Some of them are simple and they're a footpath. Some of them are more elaborate like this one. Um, and the resident constructed it? Yes. Uh, hard to say when, um, but <laughs> they, they do show up. Um, you can also see from this photograph that, uh, that you know, some of the other concerns, this is going to be an obstruction to the ditch. There are going to be stormwater implications. Uh, so the resident isn't always consulting with the county. Um, in their pursuit of these connections. Uh, moving on from there, um, looking at the county to form a process. Um, in considering that, uh, we revisited the public purpose and we found no conflict with the transfer agreement. Um, we also took the opportunity to re-engage the cities and we sent a letter of interest to all six of the cities that the trail passes through um, it, it, basically informing them of our intention to, to begin this process or reinvigorate this process. Uh, we heard back from four of the cities uh, enthusiastically. Uh, two of the cities had no objection and they were a little more passive in their, in their uh, acceptance. The four that we received back from were Dunedin, Clearwater, Largo, uh, and St. Pete. Uh, Tarpon and Seminole, again, had no objection, um, but they would... Uh, uh, welcome the first opportunity when we would talk with them. Um, we re-identified the stakeholders in the county. Um, we looked to form a working group representative of that. Um, departments like public works, parks, building and development review services, administrative services, the county attorney's office, and Forward Pinellas, which previously hadn't been very involved in these types of um, uh, opportunities. Um, we think that what this will look like uh, as it progresses through uh, will be something akin to a contract review system where you've got track changes, you've got um, you know, dates and times when people reviewed it and checked off on it, and, and it would basically represent everyone's full participation. The stepped process, just basically uh, representing what I've just said in a, in a different way. Uh, first, 
what would happen? The county would receive the request from a proposer. Uh, secondly, Parks and Conservation Resources would be assigned as the customer service representative or case manager. Um, at, it is at that time that we would actively engage the city, whichever one it was uh, uh, within, begin a collaborative review of all the county departments that I just mentioned on the previous slide. Um, some of it would be of the departments who would participate, could be dependent on the scope of the uh, proposal, dependent on the circumstances. Um, ultimately, resulting from that would be a utilization permit, as it's currently termed. Um, and we did, in this interim period of a year, establish that the Building and Development Review Services Department would continue to uh, house that, that, uh, that process. And then lastly, we would build it, or they would build it more specifically. Considerations along the way, um, clearly you can see from the previous slides that there is a bit of a shift in the philosophy. Uh, we're moving away from, uh, or we're moving to how can we approve a connection versus uh, possibly citing reasons to, to deny a connection. Uh, so that's an important distinction that, that guided the, uh, the entire process. Um, we're recommending a cu customer service approach uh, in that regard. Um, some of the assumptions uh, that, are, that are made that are consistent throughout um, would be design specifications. Uh, it'd be determined on, uh, based on the circumstance. Um, Again, if, if a business was proposing an at-grade sidewalk connection, as the, like in the one pictured there, uh, the, the specifications and the standards would be a bit different. They're gonna be simpler in comparison um, to maybe an elevated span or a bridge crossing, something like that. Um, the collaborative county review that would uh, be in the image of a contract review system would account for things like limiting liability avoiding additional operations and maintenance costs, maintaining functional stormwater conveyances, and ensuring for safe use and enjoyment of the public. The final result, the county and the landowner would reach an agreement to allow construction, and the private property owner would, would build the improvement. Um, ultimately, the improvement, as the county has now uh, engaged in the enterprise asset management system, City Works, uh, the improvement would be captured there and could be managed uh, from that point forward. Um, and then lastly, uh, the result, increased community uh, and community enhancement and public use and participation. Um, the two slides there, uh, the one on the left is the Mears Crossing, a large apartment complex uh, that involved the city of Tarpon Springs, uh, very successful one. And the one to the right is just to give perspective about the sense of community uh, that's uh, Dunedin Main Street, and uh, there's a bicycle shop in the, in the background, and they have a sidewalk connection to the trail currently. Um, with that, I would conclude and open it up to any comments or questions. Commissioner Gerard. So, just to clarify, if um, an existing neighborhood, say, or a complex like that could go to their city and say, we'd like to have a connection to the trail from our property, they would have to work through the city rather than try to do something themselves. Correct, that would be our understanding. That's how it is working at present. Okay, all right. Um, okay. Uh, Mr. Eggers. Yeah, could you, could you, re I'm sorry, could you repeat uh, the answer to the, uh, and the question itself? I just wanna make sure I caught that. Yes, sir. The question, uh, if there was a neighborhood association, homeowners association that was looking to gain access to the trail, uh, would they work through their respective municipality? Okay. And the answer was yes, and that is how we're presently handling it. And, th and that's because we're, st we're staying away from residential. The residential example here that was um, the one that we would stay away from is the private individual <coughs> residence. Uh, if there was a larger community which would ma meet the public purpose test, that puts it in a different category. Um, and we would look to partner, like I said, with the city. Uh, it could be an unincorporated area as well. I just want to make sure I'm understanding why that one would require a partnership with the city versus applying for it directly. Uh, because of the number of people that serve, and I think the critical factor is that the traffic could be both ways. 
uh, meaning people could exit the trail into the same neighborhood and they could gain access from the neighborhood to the, uh, to the trail. The residential examples, um, generally the private property owner does not prefer that, uh, that trail patrons exit their private property uh, through the gate in their backyard. I think your question was really to why you have to work through the city mm -hmm. rather than come to us directly. Yeah. Oh, the ownership of the trail. The uh, state's, the DOT's conveyance of the trail, uh, the, the county's ownership of the trail, which is approximately 60 feet on either uh, right. uh, side or center line of the trail. Still not, still not gather, uh, understanding it completely. So if, I will, if I can help, yeah. if, if there's a, if, if there's a um, subdivision that wants to gain access to the trail, <clears throat> the question was why wouldn't they just come to us directly rather than work through the city? If I, you know, and I would think that it was that we'd want to work with the city of which the subdivision resides in, um, but I'll let Lyle answer that. Right, yeah, ultimately they would partner with the county, but we would engage the city uh, to be sure that they were in favor of it, okay. that there weren't any considerations that we'd overlooked okay. that they had concerns with. Yeah. Well, that's that's different, but the agreement would still be with that individual. Between the county and the... And the, and the, uh, and the, yes. and the HOA or whatever. Correct. Uh, so, so the HOA is a group of homes. It's not an individual home. So you're saying that it's a different... So, so when we talk about residential here, it's really single homes, Correct. single family homes that yes. you're talking about, that we don't want to have um, ways to connect to the trail. Other than they have a gate they can walk out and up this up and get onto the trail, but we don't want what we're trying to do is a, avoid having those folks. I, I mean, other than the numbers that would come from that potentially, what's the rationale behind that? The fact that it uh, generally only benefits a single family home um, or, or, or the private property owner. Talk about the public purpose and the DOT requirement. Correct. It doesn't, it doesn't meet um, what the county attorney's office has defined as public purpose. It doesn't have a broad enough base of public access. It's very okay. limited. And it's also only one direction. So, so meaning you don't, you don't have trail patrons um, who would be accessing someone's private backyard. They, they want to restrict the use to one-way traffic. Okay, so but let me just get, cut to it. Let's say it's an apartment complex. Directly to the apartment complex. It's not going into an HOA neighborhood. Yes. It's going to an apartment complex. So it's just one-way traffic. But it's more than one person, but it's still one-way traffic. You're not letting the public onto the apartment complex. The circumstances may, may vary slightly, but going back to the first photo yeah. uh, at Alta Bel Air, the, the sidewalk, what you don't see in the view there to the left is that sidewalk extends through the city of Largo um, to South Fort Harrison. So, so it is, that's how we um, negotiated, I guess, the, the public access is, okay. it's not restricted. So there, therefore, you, if you do that with an apartment complex like that, you must have some kind of public access to, to say a roadway or yes. another sidewalk or what, some other right of way. Yes, okay. correct. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested in the process a little bit more. I certainly think this is a, a very positive way of doing things. Um, what brought this to me, you know, brought it a year ago was a particular business in Dunedin that has had a bridge to their, pro to their, to their business in probably 20 years. Yes. So, so we came along and said that had to go away. We put it on hold and uh, then we've had this discussion. So I'm really glad to hear that. They have apparently, from what I understand, had a design completed. Um, I don't know where it is in terms of submitting it to the county. But really, uh, their process would involve um, a design that uh, is, is, is a more permanent fixture, but also handicap accessible. So is that part of the... Yes, of that's the, one of the considerations in, the, uh, in, in one of the previous slides about engaging all the right stakeholders and establishing design criteria. ADA is absolutely top of the list. Um, if I'm thinking of the same uh, private uh, business in this case, We've spoken to them as recently as this week and uh, believe that she's excited about this new prospect of, of coming back and revisiting her circumstance. Yeah. No, I, I, I reached out to her. I wanted to make sure she watched our conversation today just to make sure that she was as comfortable as she seemed to be after, I don't know if it was you that reached out to her, somebody reached out to her. And, yes. And that was appreciated. Um, our so, director actually reached out to her okay. and spoke to her personally. 
Okay. Well, in any event, I think this is a positive step forward. I, um, when, I, when I see all of these departments um, getting together, I, you know, I think from, I'm just thinking about from a, a resident's perspective, I get just a little bit, you know, nervous because there's like uh, five or six groups here that have, you know, but I like the idea, again, how can we approve a connection approach versus denying a connection? That's critically important because we can always find a reason to say no. Correct. And but, to your point, uh, the number of um, in departments involved could be intimidating to yeah. an applicant. And that's why Parks and Conservation Resources will, be ass will assign themselves as the case manager or customer service liaison, whatever term you'd, you'd like to use. But uh, we would help navigate them through that as opposed to just kicking them into deep water. And, and I don't, is Paul still here? <laughs> Paul's still here. I, if he's not, I'm just, he, he I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. Sure. Paul, you're the advocate now, remember that, <laughs> to making it happen. So anyway, thank you for the, the, the thoughtful approach to this, and I, I'm, I'm encouraged by this. So I just really appreciate that effort. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Gerard. Yeah, I think this is a great solution, too, to make it so that it has to have a public access component <clears throat> to it. That makes a lot of sense. And. Uh, we will have this on the website somewhere that people can apply to have work. I mean, basically, it's going to be a homeowners association or apartment complex or whatever. Correct. Business. Yes. Okay. That's cool. Can I, can I just ask a couple? Yes, sir. Just, um, just a specific examples that I'm thinking about as I walk through Dunedin specifically. Mm -hmm. That's where I go for my walk. So, mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, see some some homes that have put you know, some tile out just to make it easier for them to go. It's on our right of way. It's not, it's movable. It's not like cemented in. And then I get up into the business section and you have um, some uh, beer distributors that have, you know, connected, if you will, uh, to the trail. And, and it's not in a, uh, a formalized way. It's in, the, it's in the managed area of Dunedin's downtown. So I'm just wondering as we formalize this how how uh, and it's a flat surface, but it's got a slight incline from the business to the. How is that is that going to have to be formalized process then if they want to connect that? Um, going to have to show how that connection is going to be, and um, it's going to have to go through the same process. That's what I'm hearing. Um, or yeah, the process will be the same, but the real question is where you have kind of grandfathered. Um, access points that, like you said in that one example, you had someone that had a bridge here for 20 years. It's when they triggered and made improvements to the bridge because, you know, it was falling down that really kind of triggered that process to say, <clears throat> you know, we've, we've got to look at this. Um, it's in our right of way. And so if you don't have handicap accessibility, somebody trips and falls, you know, you know, you know who they're suing. Okay. And so we've, <clears throat> so we've got to, we've got to go back and, and look, but without, we're not trying to go down and you know, be Gestapo and look at every, you know, yeah. time they put a tile down through yeah. there to where they, somebody can walk through there. Um, but, but we certainly are trying to, you know, if they want to have a commercial access, then they, they need to go through this process. Okay, well, I will kind of see how things go then. And, <laughs> and, and we'll, are we going to formalize this at, at, a, at a commission do meeting? We, or do we need any kind of formal action on this? or no? Not that I'm aware of. We're, so already, you're just, we're already putting it into practice. Okay. okay. Good. Well, good luck with all of it. I, I hope it, it sounds good. So. Okay. And for the questions, Commissioner Long. Yes, I'm so sorry. Microphone. Could you repeat the two municipalities that did not respond in an enthusiastic, positive way? <laughs> yes, and, and in fairness to them, um, the way the letter of intent was drafted is that no response was necessary. It was basically by objection only that we uh, expected to hear from you. So um, six, four of the cities, they were really quick to respond, and the two, I think, are just confident that we'll, we'll handle it appropriately and involve them as necessary, so. But which one? It was, was that's, um, a, that's a very politically correct That was just gonna that say, was, that was really, really, really well done. <laughs> <laughs> say I lost my note, but. Tarpon uh, and Seminole, I believe. Yeah, Tarpon? Correct. Tarpon and Seminole, correct. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. And, and just last point, Commissioner, you know, I, I think the approach you're seeing here is what we're trying to do throughout our, our building and development processes um, of, of trying to find a way to help people get to yes um, while adhering to our standards. 
Um, and so you'll, you'll see this throughout our processes as we continue to refine it. I was in here yesterday watching entire planning building development group and they were brainstorming ways to improve our process. And they spent all day in here, you know, and, and it's, like, it's like a balloon. Well, let's do this. Well, then this person over here goes, wait a minute, but that changes the, you know, it's a complicated process. Um, but I can tell you staff's, you know, all in on working towards these improvements and they're, they're doing that every day, both in terms of um, changes in process and design and also use of automation. Um, so it's a, it's a work, there's no question it's a work in progress, but just like this with them leading this, you know, they're, they're working really hard and I appreciate all their efforts. Yeah, I, I, the work in progress I think is the key word, so I'm hoping that commissioners like myself can be patient and that we get there. <laughs> so I'll have to remind myself about the patience part, but thank you for this. This is great. I'm really excited about it. Thank you, Mr. Fowler. Next up, commissioners, is um, Stantec uh, Airco Development Study. So Tom Julesberry is going to come up, and he's got um, Diane Chadwick with Stantec and Evan Johnson with Housing Community Development. They've done an extensive um, review of the Airco Master Plan Report, um, and there's some nuances that have changed since they probably um, pitched this to you last, so I'll turn it over to Tom All right. to kick this off. Morning, commissioners. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Um, just want to give you a background on Airco before I turn it over to uh, Diane Chandwick with uh, Stantec, sort of give you an idea as far as where we are today. Um, back when the golf course first closed back in 2011, the Airco parcel was rezoned at that time to accommodate aviation, light industrial, and commercial development. Uh, the county's comprehensive plan was later amended in 2011 to specifically address the redevelopment of Airco. The previous year, in 2010, there was a 46 and a half acre parcel on the airport property located between Airco and the Featherstown community that was approved by the FAA and designated as a green buffer area, which intended to provide a transitional area between the adjacent community of Feather Sound and future uses on Airco. This designation included an agreement between the FAA and the county to transfer development rights with the buffer area to Airco. Building on the 2008 and 2011 planning efforts uh, in 2016, Duke Energy conducted a site readiness report that looked at the site's characteristics, transportation assets, utility capacity, and associated redevelopment. So before the FAA will permit any development on Airco, either aeronautical or non-aeronautical, the EA is required in February 2020. The airport completed the EA and received a finding of no significant impact. Around that same period of time, Pi was also in the process of updating its airport master plan, which was completed in 2021. In order to develop the aeronautical portion of Airco that runs adjacent to the east side of airfield, a uh, new parallel taxiway is required to provide airfield connectivity. Design of the new taxiway is currently underway, scheduled for it to be completed in 2022 and go to construction in 2023. In a collaborative effort, the airport along with economic development, the planning department engaged Stantec to develop an updated master plan for Airco as required by the county comp plan. So this time I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Diane for the rest of the presentation. Good morning, my name is Diane Chadwick and I am a planner and a project manager with Stantec. This was uh, Tom's slide, so I'm gonna, whoops. Can you bring that microphone right up to you a little bit? There you there go. You go. Thank you. Got to figure out how to make this work. It's, mm, mm, mm. you wanna come here and help me, Evan? The right, <laughs> the right button will advance it forward. It's not, it's not doing that. Maybe it's, ah, it's the left one. <laughs> it's the left button that advances it forward. Um, it may be upside down, I'm not sure. You think, maybe, maybe that's the case. <laughs> I'm not looking very bright here, am I? <laughs> um, anyway, 
As you're aware, the county owns two parcels in this area to the east of the airport. And of course, we're here today to talk about the Air Coast site, but I do want to mention the easternmost parcel, which is east of Evergreen Avenue. And that parcel was intentionally left out of this study because of its environmental conditions and also the commitments the county has made over time with the adjacent uh, surrounding neighborhoods that it would remain undeveloped. So with AIRCO, you have an aeronautical side, and the plans that we produced intentionally brought forward and carried forward the, the intent of the uh, airport master plan and what was proposed there. There are somewhat limited um, develop, developers that do that kind of work, but they are out there. And we focused a lot of our effort on the non-aeronautical side. There is, of course, a very strong interest in the market. As you can imagine, in the, um, in the huge amount of development that is happening in the whole Tampa Bay region right now, any parcels of larger size are very much in demand for light manufacturing, warehousing, distribution, and, of course, for an office market. Um, so we went through multiple different uh, scenarios. We've, we've worked with your staff, uh, the county planning, county engineering, your EDC office, and the airport staff. We did a lot of vetting, a lot of in-person meetings, and then the pandemic hit, so we started doing a lot of team meetings. And I, I think there was a lot of individual review by your staff people as they looked through the different scenarios as they were produced. We kept getting new ideas and, and putting those into plans and then coming back with something new to keep talking about that. Uh, so as we continued to refine those concepts, that led us to the final scenarios of six and seven. Then those concepts were modified to accommodate the no-fill scenario of uh, the Limois line. So the Limois line and the new FEMA maps reduce the amount of development area that could be used on those sites, as you can see by that slide, how much it was reduced. But the report, report findings discuss both of those um, type, aviation, non-aviation, uh, likely that the aviation side would need a master developer type partner, and the non-aviation side could be accomplished by a single user or a master developer. Question. I'm yes. sorry. Um, just one. I'm looking at that. that. Oh no, I was looking at well, the previous. Let me go back. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe it's the next map that will further define the um, airport development. Yes, the okay. slides further in show it. Okay, okay, I'll okay. just wait then. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Did you cover what a Limwa line is? is the Limwa line, line is the blue line on this map. What, why, what is it? What is it? What does it stand for? It okay. stands for limited, moderate limit of moderate wave, wave action. action. Yeah, and because I was asking, I mean, we've got so many different, <laughs> yeah. different pieces. And, yes. And how is this applied? And that, why, why is that a limiting factor? Well, I will, I'd like our engineer to answer that. It's the that. high water mark or, of where we can put sand, want, I think. Or you want to, <laughs> should we hold that question towards the end, if you want to? Kind of a, it's kind of a new piece. We're, 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 we're used to high, you know, coastal high hazard. We're used to FEMA, you know, type designations. This was a new piece that, yeah. at least for me, <laughs> that I, I, I had to ask several questions about. So I, I it thought, was for us, too. <laughs> it came about as we were, had come into this process, and it changed made us have to stop and drop back and and look at things differently. And I don't know if, if your so, person's going to be here. To yeah, we have, uh, we have Lisa Foster here who can answer those questions. Do you want to answer that now or wait until the end of the presentation? We're glad either way. Um, uh, I can wait. Okay. Um, I, think, right. I think I can wait. <laughs> yeah. It may get into a lengthy discussion. So, uh, so yes, let's wait on that. So, um, so scenario six is a maximum development type um, scenario. Uh, I would note that uh, you can see on this site plan, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but each of our scenarios created a spine road that created a separation between the aviation and the non-aviation. It, it will create a nice boundary between the two. Uh, the non-aviation side where we're focusing is 
designed for manufacturing, office, and commercial uses. It, but it does preserve the initial aviation layout shown in your airport master plan. For non-aviation uh, portion of the site, this scenario has three buildings uh, ranging in size. And uh, I just want to note parking uh, in, in this because I think this is important to how the site could be developed. But we did look at surface parking for industrial uses and surface and a combination of surface and parking under office buildings. And in this scenario, the northernmost building is designed as a parking deck that would have joint use for both industrial employees and office visitors. Uh, it's important to note in both of these scenarios, the loading for the industrial building is on the west side of the building. That was intentional to uh, continue to buffer the areas to the east, the uh, Feather Sound area and the residential just in that area. So is the, is the parking uh, looked at differently when you're looking at that Lemoy line? Yes, it is. a deck like that? Okay. There are some different things you can do with parking in that area, like it, those parking lots could be flooded uh, in a storm event when you knew sure. there was a storm event where you wouldn't have cars sitting there. Okay. So yes. Thank you. Um, and also elevating buildings up, you need to do that, and you can utilize the under, under the office buildings for parking. So uh, in both scenarios, the truck traffic for specifically for any industrial user is, is directed to the Stony Brook, Brook uh, exit, or not exit, uh, right away. And then both the employee and visitor uh, access remains on 34th Street. Uh, you will notice on these maps that there is a large concrete apron area on the far west side of the site. And of course, that is for aircraft uh, users for those aviation buildings. So scenario seven uh, was primarily designed as a single user type development with some smaller office buildings attached to it. It has slightly less than 400,000 square feet of manufacturing, which is a little bit larger than what's in scenario six. However, with the office buildings that are on this plan, they're at like 192,000 square feet. That is significantly less than scenario six. And again, the parking in this area, surface for manufacturing type uses and both surface parking and limited parking under uh, buildings for office uses. The interesting thing about this one is uh, it does modify the access into the project uh, from Olmerton. We have had conversations with DOT about this, but the point of the new configuration there is to create a grand boulevard and a sense of place and a sense of arrival to this site, which it currently right now there's a lot of roads coming into different areas, so it doesn't necessarily create an attractive sense of arrival. So we did, as part of our contract, do cost estimates, and we did that for both scenarios, and the estimated cost of improvements will create site-ready land for vertical development by future tenants. And as you can see, there's not a significant amount of cost difference between these scenarios. So recommended steps as you move forward, there will need to be, uh, dependent on the, um, development scenarios you agree to and uh, move forward with, you will likely need some comprehensive plan changes and then zoning changes to implement what you do in your comprehensive plan. Uh, and of course, you want to continue to allow for flexibility for the Airco site while also maintaining the intent of your agreement with the surrounding communities. Uh, we anticipate that you would have um, additional community meetings with Feather Sound to present the findings of these studies and what you anticipate the development direction to be there. And then you may wish to enter into um, an RFP, RFN process to seek out developers who might be interested in working on these properties as a lease agreement. And at this point, we have a host of people here who can answer questions for you. And so I will stop there and have you um, go to any questions that you may have. The, there isn't, I mean, you just give us the options of maximum development, 
or single use. There isn't a recommendation today that you want to flesh that out as far as well, if we go through the RFP process. Is that? I would say a lot of the recommendation goes to uh, what type of proposals or uh, people who respond to an RFP, RFN process. Uh, you really need to know the answers to that before you say, yes, you should do this. Because okay. the market is very fluid. Right. That's where I was, that's yeah. where I was going. Yeah. Um, and then, and this may not be for you, but, um, and I, I feel like I'm, my memory is kind of gone, but didn't we receive a study several years ago from Duke Energy yes. on the economic yes. aspects of the property? Yes. Tom mentioned that earlier. Yeah. And, and that was folded into your? Yes. All the studies that had been done on this property before we looked at as part of our work. Okay. We did Perfect. review all of that. Thank you. Including the environmental studies. Commissioners. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, well, I don't know where to begin. Um, <laughs> there's a lot here. Yes. Uh, and so um, your last comment that you made, trying to get an understanding, clearly we're going to carve out the piece, of the, the aer aeronautical piece. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of set, if you will, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, yes, that's it is. Yeah, and it's also required that that be set aside by the FAA. Okay. So what's left is really going to be dependent on really two things. One, the market. And two, once we understand what that market is, uh, that's going to dictate the type of buildings that are built. I'm assuming with these office buildings, I didn't, I can't, it's hard to see the details in here, how high they are. Um, and, and I think about that as, re, as it relates, because in the front piece, the front end of this property, it's, it's, uh, it's closer to the residential neighborhoods, right? Mm -hmm. In the back, you have the bigger buffer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're correct. We have, um, yeah, we have that buffer in between Erico. And then you also have, um, you have that development that's needed to the south. What's that? It's, I guess, could you uh, ask your question again? No, no, I'm just making comments, really. I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand where the residential development is. The, the buffer area that you're talking about is that whole, that whole green space. Right. And in the, in the north end of the property, it's a pretty large buffer area. Correct. In the front end, it's, it's, more, it's a lot narrower, and it's closer to the resident. And I'm assuming all that to the right or to the east is residential yes. neighborhood. Yes. Yes. yes, it is. So when we're talking about what we're building over there, um, you know, two-story or, uh, you know, they're like sometimes, depending on the height, 30 to 40 feet high on the warehouse areas is yes. one thing. The, 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 the doors are to the west side, so you keep the noise to a minimum. Yes. When you talk about office buildings, you're talking about higher you know, product. And so then you start getting into the interaction with the neighborhood. I, 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 yes, while we didn't define a specific height to each of the buildings, the office, the office that is along Evergreen that is north of the big manufacturing, which is the parking garage with an office on top, that's three stories tall, and that's pretty much the tallest of the structures. So if you think of 50 feet, for a max height of the, all the different buildings on that site, I think that's a good guide of what we were assuming, um, because we assume that for the, the manufacturing, the larger manufacturing so, industrial. So three stories of mm -hmm. office in that case. Yes. Above yes. a garage. Yes. Correct. And so you're talking about 70,000 foot floor plates? For I mean, the office? Yeah. I mean, you're showing 220,000 square feet. I don't know if that's including the parking deck or... When, I, when I'm in, right. in, the, in the commercial business, so when I see square footage, I think of leasable. Sure. Mm -hmm. It is that, that square footage does not include the parking deck. Does not? No. Okay. No. But the so we are talking, we are talking, that's, I mean, I don't know what the floor, you know, per, uh, the floor plates here are how big? What are you talking about? So you, you're translating to how high the buildings are. Just, just trying to get a sense of it, that's all. Yeah, so it looks like um, we've got... Yeah, I mean, this is, what, 90, 96,000 square feet on one of these? I mean, it's a very large floor, floor plate. From a, and, in, <clears throat> and again, our charge was we wanted to see what we could do from a maximize the variety as well as the development potential given what's remaining and, and how we have to park it, okay. right? So that was kind of the balance. All right, and then the other question I had is are, when we put, we're, we're doing, the, we're building the, infra, the horizontal infrastructure, 
That's the proposal. That, that is the unless, assumption. Unless somebody comes in and takes the, wants to take the And essentially thing. through talking about, that was uh, through the earlier discussions that were done pre-pandemic uh, with the market uh, expert from Stantec, that was kind of what everybody was coming back with is ultimately the county would need to, there would need to be some support for that infrastructure in order for them to do the, the pad development itself. So the tenants that come, the people that come in there, can they own the building? Or is it it's on leased no, land? It's so be on they leased land. So it's leased land. So can they have ownership of the building? Yes. Yes, okay. they can. And it would be for a, a fifty-year lease, a fifty-year fifty rent. Yeah. Uh, land Brown lease. lease. Land. Right. Okay. But commissioners also on this under, understand that through this RFP process, you know, it may be that we get some of the zoning in place, run some of the part of the infrastructure, but not all of the infrastructure. Because you could see some modifications to what's being proposed. Yep. You're looking at um, floor area ratios where you're assuming um, surface parking. Well, if they were to deck park it, then you get a different use of the site. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so there is some, there's a lot of flexibility that could be done depending on what's being proposed. But, you know, you may build out the first piece, which incentivizes then somebody to take the second piece, but not necessarily you know, run the lines all the way up because you, you want them to have flexibility on the use of their site. Yeah, the, um, uh, yeah. So, the, so the aeronautical area, there's no access from any of these roads to the aeronautical area. It, or there is? Yes, there would, yeah, to there the back be. side okay. of the facility. Oh, it would, okay, to the south side? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Same like we have on uh, the rest of the airfield. I'm almost like you're saying, Barry, on the rest of it, kind of waiting to see what the market says, because there's not, these two examples that you're using are, are, are different, quite different. Quite different, and, yeah. and that's the reason the, the, for the purpose of the RFP process, um, to, to get proposals, yeah. you know, and then we can, you know, see, because you don't want to, you don't want to necessarily restrict yourself on some of the infrastructure. Correct. And I think we'll learn a lot by, you know, through that process. Um, if I may just talk about that piece really quick. Um, just as an FYI, Pinellas County Economic Development has brought in numerous calls over the past three months in regards to people that are developers who are interested. And these are developers that are very familiar with airports as well as with manufacturing facilities. So we have quite a list of, of, of candidates waiting for decisions to be made on, on this particular parcel. And that's really what I wanted to bring today is there's a lot of interest. <laughs> so, so, so to, that, to your, your, your point, you just said the interest. Um, they're interested. They're waiting on what? They're waiting. Um, they were waiting on those presentation decisions as to you know how are, how is this going to be you know brought to the market that types of things. So they're 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 waiting. They're on a list for um, an RFN proposal, RFP proposal, whatever we make that decision. To okay, do. but they're not waiting for us to make a decision. So uh, on what infrastructure path? No, sir. Gonna, we've okay. got okay. we've got people that we've got developers that are saying yes we'll we'll take on the infrastructure components and we have others that are saying yeah. so what are you going to give us so we have a little bit of everything okay. I and i think that that's really it's very promising so we want to get the rfp or rfn process going okay commissioner flowers thank you mr chair so if the limwa says that um you're building to be able to accommodate a one and a half to three foot wave intrusion or whatever would the buildings not have to be greater than the 70 feet or so? And if that is the case, would that interfere with any of the flight plans or the flight directions for planes that are coming in to land um, since the, the strip of the airport is, I mean, because even now when you travel down Almonton Road, I, I like to see it, but you see the planes and they are very low. Um, and the tallest structure there really is the Hampton Inn Hotel, which mm -hmm. is what, five or six stories. So yeah. wouldn't that affect it, the, the height of the building? Even if you were, I would say you want your parking to be not really on the ground for flooding reasons above, but wouldn't that then reduce the height that you could build upward? Well, for that development, it wouldn't be specifically within the flight plan, but there are what's called conical surfaces that come off the sides of the, the runway that you have to keep clear. So that was taken a look at to see what the type of setbacks are required and also what the elevations would be. So that's all contemplated in that. Okay. I just learned some of that stuff when I was a city council member in St. Pete dealing with Albert Poet. So, okay. yeah. thanks. 
Yeah, working uh, as long as I did at USF St. Pete. Uh, yeah, yeah, we 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 the felt planes like, we, like sit on your building. Oh yeah, <laughs> I think landing. there's some skid marks on the top of Davis yeah. Hall there. <laughs> skid. Um, further questions? The, I'm sorry, Commissioner Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Tom, I was curious because I did. I don't think I heard any reference to expanding runway capacity. And I just wondered if you had any plans to expand the runway capacity and or add additional flights. Sure. Um, we took a look, certainly took a look at the capacity levels in the master plan. Uh, we have capacity needed to take us out at least for the next 20 years. There is land that's set aside um, to the east of our primary runway for a future general aviation runway. So land has protect, been protected for future uh, aircraft and uh, air, airfield capacity. Well, how many flights do you have coming in, and do you have yet a um, what you anticipate the total will be by the end of the year? Um, we, we do have those numbers. Um, I don't have them right now. I can tell you we do uh, approximately 130,000 aircraft operations a year, and that's a, uh, a landing or a takeoff. Uh, and we're right in line with projected forecasts that were developed with the master plan and approved by the FA to meet the 20-year outlook. And does that, I can't remember what the total number of uh, passengers is. Well, passengers, um, yeah, passengers right now, we're doing just over about 2 million. A year, right? A year, correct. And that does show us going up. Um, uh, that's why we're looking at doing additional uh, um, enhancements to the terminal to be able to handle that capacity and takes us out to about three, um, I want to say in five years, that we could accommodate three and a half million passengers, and that's total. Thank you. Sure. The, the interest from the developers that we've heard about, that's uh, post Limwa in the reduction of acreage available? Uh, actually, it's both. Both? Yeah. Both, okay. Yeah, it was continued interest. But, um, yeah. I'm going to see how many times I can work limo into my conversations today. <laughs> <laughs> really yeah. impressive. As you can see, I had a significant impact to the future development. But we're looking at utilizing that land for other purposes, uh, stormwater, uh, to be able to accommodate the buildings, uh, parking, other usage. Further questions? Thank you very much. We appreciate Thank your time you. today. Okay, last up today, we have um, Jackie Trainer. So it's going to come up and give you a Penny for Pinellas update. There's Jackie behind me. There she is. Good morning. That's still on. That's good. Good morning, I'm Jackie Trainer with the Office of Management and Budget, and this morning I'm going to give you an update on our penny projects and funding, uh, basically what we said we could do and, and where we're at with that. Uh, as you know, the penny is a 1% local government infrastructure sales source tax. It's been in effect here in Pinellas County since 1990. It was last approved in 2017 by 83% of our voters. And that's for the period, the 10-year period of January 20 to December 29. Um, it cannot be used for operating and maintenance. And as you know, we use it to fund our capital improvement program. The way the uh, distribution of the penny works is per the interlocal agreement with the municipalities. And so first we have an off-the-top countywide investment for economic development capital projects and housing at 8.3% and jail and courts facilities at 3%. So that comes off the top before it's distributed to the county and the cities, 51.75% to the county and 48.25% to the cities. And our focus today is going to be on that 51.75% uh, to the county. Basically, that's our county projects. So back in 2017, prior to the vote, we did an extensive uh, education program. A lot of community outreach. We had hundreds of presentations. 
We had a countywide survey. We had a countywide website that had a map of projects that had been delivered um, with the penny, both county and city, so we could show uh, the community what projects the penny was able to fund. And I'm, I'm happy to report that with your support, we are on track to do what we said we could do. And that is this list. Through that outreach, we were able to develop a list of projects that the county would be able to do, what we projected we'd be able to do uh, over that 10 year period. At the time, our estimated revenue was 915 million, and you can see the categories we had there uh, projected that we could do. Again, per this list, you'll see these uh, percentages and categories and specific projects spelled out on that penny list. But what I really want to call your attention to is the statement on the right of the screen, which is also at the top of every page on this, this list, and that is that the, the county allocation percentage excludes those countywide investments but more importantly, that it's subject to change because the priorities and needs as defined by the community may change over that 13-year span. You know, you're talking 2017, looking out 10 years at a list that was developed at that time, but as we all know, those priorities could change. Uh, again, we are on track to do what we said we would do, but if something changes over that 10-year span, we need to be transparent about what those changes are and why. Last June, during our budget information session, we were looking at estimated revenue of 877 million, and that was about a $100 million funding gap. And at that time, we still didn't have full project estimates included, uh, very preliminary estimates from early on. We came back in July at uh, the proposed budget, increased our revenue a little bit, 951 million. We had updated our uh, estimates. We were Balanced, we're always balanced, we have to be balanced for our first year, our approved budget. So at the time it was the FY22 budget. Um, the out years are a plan. We were balanced for that. We were looking good for the 10 year period because we also got a transfer from the general fund to help fund some of the building projects that were planned. Uh, but again, we still didn't have those full project estimates weren't included. What we wanted to do was work with the departments over the next six months and be able to come back during this budget process get updated project estimates, update our revenue, and try to balance that 10-year plan. And if, Commissioner, as you recall back when we did this work session, the issue is you established some preliminary estimates back in 2017, but you really hadn't done preliminary engineering. You hadn't scoped out the project, which is what's gonna drive you know, the budget cost. And then during that same period when they're getting those estimates, we all know what we've seen with construction costs. So that's all the things that they're trying to factor in for all the different, we see, we see the community centers and stuff that were that are very public. But remember, there's a whole public works, you know, side of the house that that they're managing for capital projects that are part of our infrastructure management uh, that they also have to factor in. So that's what Jackie and her team and all of the departments have been working on is trying to refine this overall proposal that you're seeing here today. And and to that point, Barry, and we're also getting pretty dramatic changes in, in revenues. I mean, we had the, the gap, obviously, was far lower than we thought originally because of the concerns and the pandemic yeah. and, and such. It, but that jump, even in one month. It, it did. Yeah. And and then you're, you're they're also trying to make estimates as, you know, is this a you know, one-time year? Yeah. Or is, you know, what's that, what the what is those estimates going to be five years from now? And so it's a, it's a fluid process. And so just to add to that, then, we did work with the departments in the fall. We updated all those project estimates, including those preliminary construction estimates. And as you can imagine, when you're looking out at 2027 doing a project, um, you know, it's, it's pretty tough to estimate that would be what that would be, especially right now with all the escalated costs we're seeing in materials and contractors. Um, but we, we did it, is what we know now, and we had a funding gap of $114 million at that time. But um, November and December, we worked together. We got the American Rescue Plan uh, funding, the ARPA funding. We were able to identify uh, penny projects that were eligible for that ARPA funding to offset some of the penny funding on those projects. And by December, internally, we were balanced with our 10-year plan for our penny projects. 
So, so the gap is not there anymore. Oh, I'm going to show you that. Oh. <laughs> um, so then in February, the departments submitted their budgets, their plans, their six-year plans. Again, uh, cost estimates increase more. We're, you know, we're seeing that inflation, those uh, material costs, time to get materials, construction costs, and there were some new projects requested. Um, we were also updating our revenue estimates at the same time, looking at the you know, state's estimating conference for sales tax, and now we're looking at a little over a billion dollars for our penny revenue for the 10-year period. And so I'm happy to report right now, we are very close to balancing that 10-year time frame, including the, the increased costs. This is the same graph with this updated uh, proposed plan and the updated revenue estimate. You can see the percentages are relatively, you know, proportionally the same for most of the categories with the exception of roads, bridges, and trails and the community vitality. But I want to point out those community vitality projects are the projects, uh, many of those were eligible for the ARPA funding. So we are doing those projects, they're just not they're offset by the ARPA funding. They don't need as much penny funding. And with all the um, infrastructure grant opportunities that are coming, I anticipate this will change even more. Um, this is a snapshot in time. This is our proposed plan right now. Um, with grant opportunities to be able to leverage the penny funding, you could see this change. There are already some transportation infrastructure grants coming, coming down the pike, so um, you know, we'll, we'll apply for those grant opportunities as well. Jackie, in, in 2017, we estimated that we were going to get $915 million for mm -hmm. the county portion of the penny, and then most recently, we're at $1.04 billion. Yeah. Is that, is that, did I pull those numbers out right? Yep. So, um, what, so the, the difference of not meeting or the gap, it would be the increase in costs. Yes. Because we're, we're now close, we're actually getting more than we thought. Mm -hmm. And we're taking projects off of the penny list with ARPA money. So the difference is being eaten up by the increase in cost. Is that, am I saying that right? And, yes. it's, and it's two pieces to that. It's, it's scope of the projects and inflation, you know, for the project cost. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, you take a community center. We, we said, okay, uh, this community center, we want to, you know, build a new community center. But we, we didn't do preliminary engineering. And so then they get in and they say, well, we need this feature, that feature. And then so the cost goes from one million to one and a half, and now inflation takes it to two. And, and so you're seeing a combination of the um, revised um, scope of the project and inflation hit both. And as we bring these to you, we're trying to differentiate that to where you can see scope changes versus inflation. Okay, good. That's, that's I think, important to differentiate those and know so that whereas the whoever's heading up the project might want to expand the scope, we, it, it may be a decision point for us. Uh, you, there is no question it will be a decision point because we're holding the line on scope increases, not necessarily inflation that's out of their control. Thanks. Commissioner Eggers. So again, I think, um, and also the, the, you explained the community vitality by the increased ARPA funds, with the, which those projects seem to be eligible for, which allowed us, allows us to push it a little bit apparently into the roads, bridges, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some infrastructure bills that are out there. Again, in the global scheme, it, it still concerns me on a lot of other you know, things, but there, those funds are going to be available. Um, and those will be more for the top two categories, I'm assuming. When you yeah. say infrastructure, we're talking about roads, bridges, water quality, flood, that kind of thing. And we that bring, would be my guess. I know there are transportation funds coming down for and, sure. And so we've brought on two um, consultants to assist us in going after these grants, managing these grants, and so we're going to go after it all. Uh, the factor is is what we're successful in achieving, um, but that'll that'll also potentially impact some of the projects we have on here. Mm -hmm. um, but until we you know are successful in receiving those, we we can't really build that in as a factor. Okay. I think we had a presentation not too long ago about. The kind of road conditions we got into actually road rating which you know got me all excited um that's you know really tells about the story about my life really uh, being kind of boring. engineer coming out yeah yeah it is um so so 
those, uh, you know, we have some examples, for instance, and um, just recently people calling in and asking about a community, finding out that it's in 2324, and that's not even their community. It's not even on the, on the road repair three-year plan. Um, and we clearly indicated that some of our neighborhood's roads are where we've kind of fallen behind on. I'm assuming that when we get some additional funding on roads, it's going to be hopefully to play catch up, like we are doing on the on the on the sidewalk stuff now. No question. Yeah. And you know, so there's there's a couple areas we prioritize. One is in the community vitality you just mentioned. That's that's not just taking money from ARPA and using it to support. If you if you notice, we implemented connection issues that are far greater than what we were going to do with the penny money. We were going to do some upgrades and repair sidewalks and stuff with the penny money. Now we're going to actually make connections, and we're going to do the safe routes to schools. So, so it was a combination of freeing up some penny money, but doing so much more to enhance that community. Um, and so there's a combination of that. On the other piece, we're going to see where the money is. The, I doubt you're going to see federal money for local roads, but you may see it for roads, uh, main arterials that, in fact, we had on the penny list that would free up dollars to, to be able to way. reprogram. Those are the things that we're going to have to um, see how successful the grant applications are to where we can factor that in. Yeah, I think that's clearly an, an area that we've we got it we got to bolster it up. You made comments at the meeting about you know fixing a bad road versus maintaining a good road is totally different in cost, mm -hmm. and so we're really wasting money, if you will, but we're going to have to to get these roads caught up. So that's important. The other thing that you mentioned a couple of times, Jackie, was transparency on changes. Um, and I think that's really important because as I talk to a lot of people, you know, they're, you know, obviously 83% approved this. 83% of those who voted, because it was in an off year, there wasn't that many, there weren't as, as, as many people voting that year, so they weren't as engaged possibly. We're trying to educate them up a little bit along the way to what actually is in here, but those changes that we're talking about it's so critical to communicate to our right. residents and not assume anything. Assume right. that they are not up to speed on it and, and really keep them in the and loop. So that's we were, really, oh, go ahead. We were waiting on this plan to where we could really be able to tell the story. The next piece is we worked in communications is prepared to do a much better job of outreach. There were so many things that were changing up to this point, you know, it was hard to tell that story. But the reality is we're delivering on exactly what we promised in 2017, exactly. Yeah. And it was it was clear in the goals, and now we can show that. And so we plan on doing a very uh, public outreach process to make sure that our residents have confidence that we're delivering on what we said. Yeah, and I think and I think more people will be listening now, and that's that's good. And, that, and I think that's really an important an, an important piece to this too. But um, okay, thank you. Because yeah, it's really our report card, so to speak. And as Barry said, we're only three years in, not even three, four years into this new penny. And already we are on track to do um, what we projected we would do. And we haven't had any changes yet. So, you know, we, we do have to keep up with that with our report card, keep the status of this, and then any changes that might be factored in. So, you know, Jackie, the other thing as you're talking to folks going forward, I think it's really important to continue reminding them that what role this penny plays. Um, it's a, obviously almost all of our capital now. It's, you know, there's not much capital built into our, um, our, our, our more, uh, what do you call it, our general fund dollars. Yeah. Or, so this is all the capital now. And yeah. so it's important to keep that perspective because folks sometimes get micro critical about it, but remembering that it's an important piece of the funding of what we do here in the county. And if we don't keep this up, if we don't do what we're, we've told people, this could be at risk. And that's a big deal because then we're talking about a millage that has no capital really, and not much capital embedded right. in it. So. And, and remember, you know, we got 35% of this that is coming from visitors. Um, and so it's real important that they assist us in keeping our infrastructure, you know, up to date. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's what we'd like, you know, as a sales tax. Everybody that buys here and uses our infrastructure, it's paying for that. It's paying for those projects. So critical. Every, you know, enterprise, we also have enterprise projects, but I would say they're not as visible as this type of project that's, that the community sees. Yeah, well, clearly this penny, Penny's been a huge success. It's just a matter of continuing that. 
good programs in communication. So yeah. thank you. Every every Rotary Club I go to, I mention the penny and and why we have the lowest debt ratio and how that works, how that's connected. So I think yeah, all of it. Yep. Yep. Uh, just so our next steps, we'll come back in June for the budget information session, and then July with the proposed budget, which will also include the capital plan. And so you'll see a, an update of this. That's it. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Jackie's obviously done a great job. She's she's got an, another year before she goes and retires. So that uh, oh, no. this is uh, this is I mean you know if you think about the number of departments that this impacts, I mean that's a lot of institutional knowledge that she brings, and so we've, we're going to be preparing for that transition over the next year. But you know she does an amazing job with a very very large <laughs> capital project uh, program. You said she has another 10 years? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ready for agenda review? Yes, sir. Okay. Sure, we're going we're gonna to take a three-minute break. Okay. Stretch your legs.
Okay, commissioners. Um, items one and two are um, proclamations and, and um, then awards for uh, different uh, mental health and for emergency medical personnel. Uh, for the latter two, uh, Pinellas uh, Federal Credit Union will be making that presentation, a check presentation, along with you. All right, we have a partner presentation uh, from Ken Burke as uh, the, uh, the 2021 audit results. Under public hearings, item number four is a countywide map amendment from residential low medium to residential medium. Uh, this is at the intersection of 52nd Street North and 28th Street in the Lelman Community Redevelopment Area, uh, consisting of three vacant parcels. Um, this will allow a, a higher density. Um, it currently allows up to eight units under the residential medium, allow up to 11 units or 16 units if an affordable housing density bonus is pursued. Um, the uh, Redevelopment Area Advisory Committee was briefed at their December 15th meeting and Port Pinellas and Planners Advisory uh, both recommended unanimously for approval. Item number five is a countywide map amendment from residential low medium and scenic non-corridor to office and scenic non-corridor. This is at um, 1961 East Lake Road. It's just north of the Woodlands Boulevard Parkway there. Um, and it's, it's currently a um, private school, or a, it was formerly a private school, and they're looking to use that as office. Um, and so you can see in, within the text, you know, the proposed category would allow 11, 11 residential units, uh, but the, um, they're gonna pursue a separate zoning amendment that would limit the site to professional office uses and prohibit residential uses. Both for Pinellas and Planners Advisory Committee recommend approval. Item number six is a countywide map amendment, residential low medium to retail service, uh, to retail services, 0.338 acres um, located at 90 South Terrace. This is 200 feet west of Seminole Boulevard, it's one vacant parcel. Uh, the applicant intends to change the land use to um, create consistency with the, under, with the underlying zoning. Um, this would allow a, lot, a wider range of non-residential uses that are compatible with the local zoning category. Both Ford Pinellas and Planners Advisory uh, recommend unanimously approval. And then finally, item number seven is a countywide map amendment from recreation open space and residential rural to residential rural and recreation open space. Not sure I understand the difference on that one, but um, they are consist of two parcels located within the Cypress Run master plan community. Um, this would provide for two parcels that they would build two uh, single family detached dwellings on in the southern parcel. Um, both Ford Pinellas and Planners Advisory un unanimously recommend approval. Gary, on that one, I think they're just swapping pieces so that they can build on one and then they're giving up buildable area in another spot, so. That makes sense. Yeah, I think that. <laughs> this, did this one get punted from an, a previous meeting? Yeah, I, I think we did have something. Or did we that. do this one at a previous meeting as a different authority? Tom, do you know? Because that, that, that parcel, I mean, it, it's, it, I think I, it's exactly the same that we looked at before. I, I think, I, I agree. I, I saw something with Cypress Run before, I just don't recall. Okay. But why don't I ask Tom to track that down and send you an email to confirm All right. exactly what that is. Thank you. Okay, at eight citizens be heard. You've got items from the clerk of court. You got miscellaneous items received for filing. Um, quarterly report of settlements. Item over to item, unless there's questions on any of those. Item 14 is uh, economic development. This is award of bid to Gibson Air Conditioning for Star Center Air Handling Replacement for 875,000. Item 15 is a joint project agreement with the Town of Bel Air. So they're gonna be, um, uh, this is associated with the, with the county proposed sidewalk improvements on uh, Mecklenbacher Road. Um, the water main um, must be replaced and realigned because of the proposed sidewalk within the county's right of way. So the estimated cost is $357,000 funded by the Town of Bel Air. Item 16 is award of a bid to Institute Form Technologies for three locations um, for sanitary sewers, and that's in B Pond Road, Hamlin Boulevard, and 46th Avenue North. 
$1.2 million. And this was part of the 22 budget. Commissioner Flowers? Um, question one is, um, it does say within the scope of the work, it's to extend the life. Did they say how long they feel that um, utilizing Institute Form will extend the life of the um, sewer piping? And um, are we looking at this down the road to actually fully replace um, so that we'll have that as a part of our construction project? Yes, hi, Megan Ross, Utilities Director of Pinellas County. And the Institute Forum performs the uh, cured in place pipelining. And actually, what that does is it pretty much builds a new pipe inside the pipe. So it lasts for about 40 years. And with this technology, it significantly reduces the replacement cost because you do not have to open trench, dig up the roads. Um, you can simply utilize the existing pipe that is you know, end of its useful life, it's got some cracks and, and things that need to be improved and you can build a, a brand new pipe right inside that pipe. Yeah, I'm, familiar. Sorry, I'm familiar with the institute form, I just wasn't a, um, aware of the length of life and you just said 40 yes, years. Yes, 40 years. That's what I wasn't aware of. Yeah. So. Okay, thank you. Is there a location map for the three sections of those three rows that are, or is it? Yes, we do have a location map and I can send that to you. Okay, thank you. And I'll go ahead and I think Mr. I'm going to, oh, sorry. Uh, good morning, Megan. Good morning. Um, so this question is not really relevant to this particular item, but can you recap quickly for, for me, please? We have miles of this kind of pipe in Pinellas County, right? Yes, we are, we utilize lining quite a bit, and I'm sure you've seen it on the agenda um, from time to time. And so... It's, uh, we do no, uh, numerous miles every year. And we do that through identifying the condition of our pipes through the TV process. We send cameras on pipes constantly every day and we identify where those defective areas are and we schedule them for design and construction to line those pipes to correct so, them. So, but overall countywide, do you remember the number in your head of how many miles of pipe we have? I just find it extraordinary. It's, it's definitely a lot. I don't know if I have our, our engineering division sure. director here. I don't know if he has a number, but we can get that to you. We line about two to three miles a year, and we've been doing that for a number of years, so I can get a total over to you. And then that. while they're getting that, could you also ask them how many miles of water pipes we have? Oh, absolutely. We have about 2,000 miles of water pipes. We don't line water pipes typically because it's, those are pressurized. So it's just a different uh, method. We typically use lining for the gravity sewer pipes. Okay, thank you. Sure. Stay right there. Okay. Stay here. For the next item. So um, item 17 is ranking of firms with CDM Smith for professional engineering service. This is re related to the regional resource recovery facility. This, this project will be done in three phases. So we're talking about the first phase of $2.3 million. Um, and the, per, the phase one is expected to last two years. And so, Megan, if you could just provide a brief re re recap of the recourse, resource recovery facility. Yes, absolutely. And we have a brief presentation today explaining uh, the purpose and phasing of the regional resource recovery facility. So this project will primarily address our future of wastewater biosolids management, our approach in combination with potentially integrating other waste streams so our objective today is just to provide a brief overview of the biosolids management challenges, the project purpose and benefits, and how the project aligns with Pinellas County strategic initiatives. So we'll also present just a preliminary project schedule with the tasks included in phase one of the project, which is the item being recommended in your agenda. So due to the state's fragile ecosystems, nutrient management continues to be a significant challenge in Florida. Nutrient pollution is considered to be the cause of just various water quality issues throughout the state that have become more prominent over the past few years. So all of these issues have culminated in the legislative action called the Clean Waterways Act, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, also known as Senate Bill 712, which was signed into law in June of 2020. And the goal of this law is to protect Florida's water resources. So the law focuses on minimizing the impact of nutrient pollution sources and strengthening regulatory requirements. So part of this included changes 
in various wastewater management practices. And as a result, the state regulations on biosolids uh, land application, specifically Florida Administrative Code 62-640, they were revised in 2021 with even more stringent requirements regarding biosolids use on land. So these regulatory changes are estimated to reduce land application sites throughout the state. And additionally, <coughs> concerns regarding uh, emerging contaminants in biosolids may result in further restrictions in the future. So these changes are requiring more and more municipalities to seek an alternative means to manage biosolids, which are less dependent on the land application disposal. With this project, Pinellas County is taking a proactive approach to address this issue. And currently the total annual dry tons produced in the county is, is over 20,000 uh, tons of biosolids. So that's with all municipalities combined. So given these conditions and similar challenges faced by other municipalities in the area, this is an opportune time to consider managing biosolids with other waste streams holistically and to explore the synergy among the waste streams through a regional resource recovery facility. So specifically, uh, Pinellas County is poised to provide the regional leadership to address these challenges and looking to explore the benefits of public-private partnerships once again as part of our solution. And as you know, for nearly 20 years, the county has provided beneficial reuse of 100% of our biosolids through the thermal drying and pelletizing process located at the South Cross Bayou facility. In addition, the county has provided a regional solution to waste disposal through the waste energy facility uh, for many years. So both the county's biosolids pelletizing facility and waste to energy facility follow a public-private partnership model. And as the current biosolids facility is reaching its end of useful life, we now want to leverage our expertise and experience, as well as the experience of our municipal partners to provide a regional solution for reuse and recovery of biosolids and potential other waste streams. So the new facility will be designed to incorporate these regulatory requirements and also potentially help to achieve the solid wastes goal of the zero waste to landfill. So the project contains multiple components um, and aligns with the county strategic plan with respect to practice of environmental uh, stewardship and sustainability by removing excess nutrients from the environment and improving beneficial reuse of waste streams countywide. The project will seek to incorporate green sustainable technologies that will reduce our carbon footprint and foster a more resilient and sustainable community. So again, the Regional Resource Recovery Facility is an example of not only Pinellas County departments working together, but also other municipalities as shown here to help develop a more regional solution to biosolids treatment. So the goal of the facility will be to beneficially reuse the biosolids generated in the county and by nearby partners to sustainably recover the inherent resource values to produce alternative pro uh, products that will effectively eliminate the need to rely solely on landfilling and land application. The county has an overarching goal of being more sustainable and resilient, and through this project, we can enhance environmental stewardship, implement green technologies, and mitigate vulnerabilities. So the synergistic characteristics of other waste streams, such as the fats, oils, and greases, uh, and typical solid waste resources, such as yard wastes, food wastes, and tires, will be examined to utilize and maximize the resource recovery of these streams. So the vision of this facility is to bring the region together to accomplish common goals. So protecting the environment, meeting regulatory requirements, adapting to future regulations and markets, uh, being economically viable, leveraging synergies of our partners and their resources, and gaining public acceptance. So this busy graphic shows the overall concepts that will be explored during this feasibility study. The left-hand side of the slide depicts some of the available resources that we have, such as biosolids, food wastes, and yard wastes, that can be converted through the use of some of the various proven treatment technologies shown in the middle in order to convert these resources into marketable products, such as energy, fertilizers, and soil amendments. And just a quick overview of the project schedule. The implementation is planned to be in three phases with the project completion 
nearing the end of 2028. So we anticipate the facility will be fully constructed and operating by January of 2029. And this phased approach allows for effective planning and decision making as far as um, implementation and delivery of the project. And finally, the slide outlines the tasks included as part of the phase one, which is on the agenda today, with the outcome being a comprehensive preliminary engineering report. So one of the key initiatives throughout the duration of this phase includes engagement of stakeholders throughout the development of the agreements with some of our potential partners that we've already been talking to, such as the cities of Clearwater, Largo, Dunedin, Oldsmar, Tarpon Springs, and St. Petersburg, as well as other neighboring partners across the Bay Area that are potentially interested. So another key component of this phase will be a business case evaluation that will be performed to create a long-range economic model for the facility that includes both funding and financing alternatives, as well as operating costs and revenues. And that concludes my presentation, so I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Commissioner, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so um, I certainly, when I was thinking and through this, uh, the wastewater sludge and pelletizer so, um, biosolids and that kind of thing, I understood that and made sense. And um, instead of spreading it out all over the state of Florida, um, we can actually take care of it here at home. Uh, we're doing it, but others aren't. So as Correct. you say, ours is uh, at end of its useful life. So these other things, we're talking about food waste, fats, oils, greases, yard, all that stuff will also be processed. Is it, it's going to be part of the study as to how we might process. Yes, so there's many synergies with some of these other resources that can be, that are now waste streams that can potentially be better utilized to create products. And actually right now, we do use fats, oils, and greases at our South Cross facility. We add that into our wastewater process and it produces methane gas, which actually then fuels our pelletizing process. So there are energy values Pretty to cool. some of these, um, some of these waste, re, you know, waste streams that can yeah. actually be beneficially reused. So we will be exploring those concepts in further detail as part of this. Yeah, and you, and you talked about a business case evaluation. So we'll see what kind of uh, partnership dollars would be involved in this exactly. exploration. Yeah. And uh, well, I think this is I think this is exciting, and it, I think this is what we should be doing. These kind of partnership evaluations. So, looking forward to it. Thank you, okay, Commissioner Long. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Megan, I just wanted to share my personal thoughts about what a blessing you have been to all of us in taking this subject matter, which when I first started on the county commission, I just thought was incredibly dry and not very interesting. And you've almost brought it to life in terms of the way you present it because you can under, even though you know we're not engineer, or all of us aren't engineers and scientists, it makes it um, yeah. understandable for the layperson, and I'm very uh -huh. grateful for that. So thank you to you and your team for all of your leadership and hard work you do every day to keep everything moving. Well, thank you so much, and I You're think uh, part of that will be a pretty robust education program so that we really can explain to the community the things that we are doing. You know, I can't I, follow up, Mr. Chair. I can't help but think about how technical all of this is and hopefully we're putting in place some kind of an apprenticeship type of program so that even our young students in school trying to figure out what they want to do and who they want to become when they grow up can come behind us and take advantage of some of these things and build a huge career out of it, like well, you have done. Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought that up. Our, we actually have an education program at the South Cross facility that's led by Shay Donovan, our education coordinator, and she's done a brilliant job at actually building, there's a program at Seminole High School that is a water resources program now. And we actually just hired our first trainee straight out of Seminole High School to begin working at the facility. And it's, so she's really done a good job just building those connections between our education institutions and, yep. and our utility and getting people, kids interested in these jobs and careers, so yeah. Thanks. This might be more of a Paul question than you, but um, our fog, our fog facility out there off 28th, capacity. Yes. How are we as far as 
capacity, and then how many, and I don't even know if there are any anymore, private fog facilities. Yeah, so our utility does own that facility, that fog facility. It's co-located on 28th Street across from Solid Waste or on, near the Solid Waste landfill sites. And we contract that out currently to a company that operates that facility, FCS, and they also do have a private facility that they own and operate. So that our county-owned facility is coming to the end of its useful life. So we are going to be incorporating that into this. So any kind of fog products that we use, if we need to rebuild that facility or look at it in a different way to incorporate food waste and other streams, we're going to use this as an opportunity to do that. I know when we first came on uh, the first year, we spent um, working with uh, a private fog facility. I'll, I'll, I'll say working with. Um, and it was every week was an issue with this one facility. That's why I just, I hadn't, I drove by that site the other day and it was a completely different business there. And I, it just made me think of uh, wondering if there were still private facilities out there around the county. So um, thank you though. Yeah. <laughs> Further questions? Well, Megan's up there. You, you mentioned about education in the community. They're also doing a lot though, Megan and her team with um, kind of apprenticeship programs and getting people interested in this field. Mm -hmm. um, and they could spend an hour up here talking about the different um, outreach and, uh, um, and interns and things that they're, they're promoting both in regular and in the engineering side. And you're going to see more of that in the budget this year. But their plan is, is a model. Um, they're, they're, they're knocking it out of the park in every which way. Um, you know, and, and so uh, they really do a good job with that. Okay, and yeah, I just I wanted to follow up on that because I have heard from folks in the community um, what an incredible job your group's doing. So to, to, to the point that you're talking about a model, I think we need to we need to really work that. I mean, obviously for self-sustaining, <laughs> getting people in that next generation, as you speak, interested in so many fascinating fields that they don't even know about. And so you're, you're gonna, gonna yeah. see that in the budget this year. There's gonna be some um, some internships and things like that that we're gonna expand out and some trainee type positions that we're creating, you know, that they don't have their PE, but they will, you know, in creating pipelines. Um, but we need to do it at all levels, mm -hmm. you know, from an entry level person in high school, um, you know, through, and they they work with career, um, you know, with, I guess it's it's not P-TECH anymore, um, but, <laughs> you know, so so they, but they have a lot of programs like that. We're gonna, you're gonna see that expand over into public works. Kelly's working on that, and so so you're gonna see a lot of this. But yeah, they have kind of a model program. They're refining, um, but you know, there's so many good jobs here that I don't think people know about. Um, you know, yeah. and we we need to tell our story. You yeah, know, I remember at one point we heard that uh, you know the average age of Pinellas County employees is over 50. So. So there was a lot of opportunities out there and uh, for upward mobility in a quicker fashion as time goes on. So I think telling the story about the multiple opportunities that are here is just so important. So anyway, look you'll forward see, you'll to that. See more, yeah. You'll see a Absolutely. lot more on that. And really quick, just once, uh, just if you give me one second, I wanted to introduce our Deputy Utilities Director, Hillary Weber. As many of you may have guessed, I am expecting a child <laughs> <laughs> by now, it's not a secret. Um, and I'll, I'll be out of the office probably late June for, for a few months. So Hillary will be stepping in as acting director. So I just wanted to, for those of you who haven't had a chance to meet her, um, put a face and to we'll, her. We'll send you her <laughs> cell phone number, okay? <laughs> Hello, commissioners. Um, just wanted to say I'm excited to be stepping into this uh, temporary acting role while Megan is out. And um, I've been at the county for almost two and a half years, and I'm really happy to be a part of the Pinellas County team. Thanks to have you. All right. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Commissioner's item number 18, uh, the long awaited. Uh, we're declaring 15 county owned parcels as surplus and granting authorization to advertise and dispose of the properties. Um, as we briefed you in the past, we had colliers come in to assist us um, as an advisory service to look at all of our parcels, uh, break them down to determine. Uh, which parcels are needed for stormwater, for there's buildings on them, whatever, but to go through approximately 1,200 parcels. Uh, so far, we've um, looked at, we believe there's about 110 that are a potential surplus. Um, and so the remainder, you know, is either parklands, properties containing buildings, like I said, stormwater, or other uses. 
So uh, staff will continue to submit parcels until we get through the entire uh, list. And so what we're doing is once it's declared surplus, then we'll work to determine whether they can be affordable housing projects, they have another potential use for economic development or other. And uh, as part of that process, then determine how to transition those into purposeful use um, of those properties. But the idea is to make sure that we, we don't have vacant parcels just sitting out there, um, that we're cleaning these up and uh, putting them back on the tax roll. So. First of all, I was excited to see the number of the ones that were already categorized for multi-use family. Um, there was one, um, I think, on Omaha where it was multi-use or estate. So when you say estate, are you talking lar one larger big home potentially or? Yeah, I would have to get staff up to answer that question. It yeah, it said or, and I'm I'm hoping that it'll be a preferably well, I think, multi I think some of those, you know, it's like with anything. We have a, a, a surplus. We took that over for whatever reason, and a lot of these have long histories, you know, that have been on our books. We'll have to look at that zoning, and it may be that we need to rezone it to where we can, you know, it's a change in use to where we can put it and make sure it goes back to a productive use. Okay. Um, and. Sometimes we may have to consolidate. You know, a lot of times you have these little slivers. We we were looking, you know, for a, another use of a potential future county, you know, function, and and we were looking at a private lot, and then we we saw that the county actually owned little slivers around that lot, none none of which could be built on. Why we didn't transfer that over to the property owner, you know, probably goes back 30 years. Who knows? Um, so it's it's going through them one by one, looking at the zoning, looking at what we can do with it, and making a determination. And so that's it's that's the reason we brought on a consultant because that's I'd have to dedicate staff to go through and do that. Somebody's got to actually do that physical work, and and so we've that's how we've been able to accomplish what we've done to this point. But to your point, we'll need to look at that and figure out how to how to do the process to make it a productive property that can be reused. And then, um, so is it that we will provide that information to persons who are on our vendors list that typically um, does construction or development, or is it that they'll just, you know, we'll just have it there, or I guess the mechanism by which we'll let people know that, you know, we have property available and these are the um, proposed intended uses. Hi, Kevin Knutson, Assistant County Administrator. Yes, um, once they're declared surplus, we'll go through a process internally to determine if there's good uses for affordable housing or industrial use or things like that. But once we've moved past that and we don't have a specific use we want to use it for, we're going to go to market. And so we're going to look for people to come to us with proposals on what to use on it and whether or not we need to make any changes to the underlying zoning or things like that to make good adaptive reuse of these properties. Okay. Because I saw a couple of lots that are, like, really primed for yeah. multifamily. So, anyway, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Question, um, Kevin, on that on that point, when you go back and have those discussions, again, I'm just talking out loud. Two things. One is that if we feel pretty strongly in being some use, it would probably be better if we rezoned it. I mean, I understand going to the market, but if we can rezone it, it brings value. Oh, absolutely. And people pay more for it as mm -hmm. opposed to giving it to them and then coming in getting the change after the fact. I mean, we could do it before the fact. I know there's a, yeah. some, some, some pieces you may not know until you go to the market what's, what it's gonna be used for, but I certainly hope we can at least go through that with that, your consultant. That's part of the process of talking to affordable housing and to economic development, because they have expertise in those areas to help real estate make those decisions. Yeah. Some of it's gonna be pretty simple. We've got some residential lots that we know are prime for somebody like Habitat for Humanity to build a home on but others are kind of free form and sitting in areas that aren't having traditional uses. So we're gonna work with staff from those departments to determine what the best and highest use yeah. is and move forward from there. And then, and then Perry, if maybe a thought or plan put together that as we bring these revenues in, I mean, parking them somewhere because we may have some other facility needs, um, I'm assuming that we're gonna not just throw it into the general fund to be used for whatever, but actually we would um, recommend that we park, park these over in future facility needs, and so that way we can then, in, in turn, as we have other facility needs, um, we can, we'll set those aside and as part of our capital, and then just yeah. once we have plans, yeah. Yeah. Thank so you. I'll keep that there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So the the non buildable lots, the um, those would be ones that we would look at. We would look to see is it stormwater? Can we can we dig a hole there and have some uh, flood control or something like that potentially? You could, and or you go to the neighbor and you know ask if they want to you know and ha half the time the neighbor's probably mowing it and doesn't even know. Um, so yeah, it'd be a combination of all those. Mm -hmm. And there's some reason it's not. I don't know which ones, but for some reason there's not buildable. You know, when you when you go in and you build a stormwater pond, you probably take more than you need. The question is, did we ever consolidate that back and get rid of the piece that we didn't need? Um, you know, same way with an intersection. You know, you're going to redo an intersection. You go in and you take, you know, and you have storage and you ramp up. Did you get rid of the slivers that you don't need once the project's done? Um, I would imagine it's a combination of all. That's the reason it's such a labor-intensive process to go through 1,200 parcels, you know, to do that. But it, it's probably going to be a combination of everything. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Nice. Item number 19 is award of a bid to Clute Contracting. This is for the um, upgrade to the cell lot restrooms over at uh, St. Pete Airport, $409,000. Item 20 is affordable housing loan program to Homes for Independence uh, uh, service source for multifamily rental housing project known as Home for Independence uh, 6 Homes Renovation Project. So this is $386,000. It's from the State Housing Initiatives Partnership Funds. And this is for renovation for six units in multifamily buildings. Um, and again, these three of the units will be restricted to households uh, not exceeding 50% and three at 60%. Um, and again, this is for um, specifically for these properties, and they're listed down at the bottom of your page. Questions? Item number 21 is affordable housing program for Fairfield Avenue apartments. Um, this is a new housing construction project with 264 multifamily apartment units, 53 being set aside for. Um, earning households at 50%, 67 units, households at 80%, and the remaining 144 work at workforce at 120% AMI. Um, county funding for the project is 5.6 million, of which 3 million we set aside for land acquisition, 2.6 for construction costs. There are other funding sources that are part of the overall um, financing structure. Um, it's part of the St. Petersburg CRA and this is the Tibbetts uh, Lumber Yard property, is that correct? This, this is the one that they just did with a new, taking advantage of the new law, correct? Changing from industrial to? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know why, well, Bruce will be here on Tuesday. We'll make sure he has an answer for you. All How right. about that? Thank you. <laughs> Um, item number 22 is um, a budget amendment, and this is to take $6.1 million from contingencies in the general fund to purchase um, a new sheriff helicopter, which is 31 years old. We discussed this a budget last year. We, until we had the contract finalized, we put that into our contingencies or to our reserves, um, and so we kept it there until we knew exactly what was occurring. This transfers that money out to be able to pay for that. And then the other piece being uh, $1.1 million is to pay for insurance pre premiums um, for the utilities department, which we then charge back through our indirect cost plan. Um, and also a change in policy. The sheriff went to uh, contract doctors over at Joe Medical, and as a result, it increased our premiums um, for that. And I think that is really him a bit having a, the ability to actually get people. And so, um, but it had an impact, so that's the other transfer in this piece. Mr. Chair? <coughs> Commissioner Long. Yeah. <coughs> yes, Barry. Um, I don't know if you'll know the answer to this right off the bat, but I would be very interested in an update, especially since we're getting a new helicopter for out at the air, sheriff's airside out there. Um, what are we doing with regard to the facilities? So the, the facility, we have uh, contracted with a company that is there, and we're building a facility on their land. Is that correct, Kevin? I'm going to get this wrong. Um, but it's good. We're going to, or they're going to build it, and we're leasing it from them. 
Um, and so that's going to be built into our budget recommendation this year. And if you don't mind me asking as a follow-up, how long is it going to take to get that done? Because they've only been waiting for, uh, I don't know, 50 years? Yeah, it has, <laughs> it has been a long time. Um, Barry was correct. We're working with one of the fixed-based operators there named Shelter. They have some property that they have leased that is available. They're going to build it and lease it back to us to use for that. It will take a year or two to do that. In the meantime, I was out there yesterday myself. We're going to do some repairs on that building. There's, there's leaks in the ceiling. There's problems with some of the doors. So we're going to make sure that it works for them during the interim period because they've been living with um, some substandard situations for quite some time. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm sorry, but your voice dipped, and I didn't hear the first part of what you said. The first they, part was that we're working with a fixed-based operator at the airport named Shelter. Yeah, and they're, they're going to build it? They're going to build it. And we'll lease and it. And we'll lease it back from them. Yes, ma'am. And there, you know, I, I know you've heard this, but those, you know, predate us, and there's been a lot of different iterations, um, and I know it's taken some time, but even on this one, we were working with the company, and then we recognized, I, I think, was it the Limwall line or whatever it was, and, and then we had to elevate it, and blah, 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 and, you know. Don't blame so, everything on the Limwall line. You know, I, I, it's my new term. I, you know, I, I need to, you know, blame that on a few things here. <laughs> well, okay, I did not hear you say a time frame for when that would get done? My expectation is it'll be finished in two years. In two years? Yes, ma'am. And, and that's, they're, they're making repairs on the current building to bring it up uh, to better good, condition. Good but they have to, that. They have to right. elevate the site to build, to build the, um, they have to elevate the site to build the, the hangar. And so that's, yeah. the, that's the revision. When we first started this process, we thought we were just gonna build a hangar. Now all of a sudden, you've gotta elevate it before you can build the hangar. And, and just for a little context, uh, when I first got here and, and discovered this project, one of the issues we ran into was building a new hangar on the site that we were currently at meant they would have to move somewhere, which we didn't really have a place to put them. And because of the how close it is to the taxiways, we would have had to build a blast wall to keep any of the jet prop wash from going into their airspace. And so moving it farther away from the, the runways and the taxiways is a lot of help as well. So this is a better solution all the way around. Okay, I'll be listening and watching. And just the for the for the final piece to this, you know, because it kind of goes to this point, is the the way we manage capital projects. Okay, and so we um, have purposely separated out between um, facilities and construction. We have a construction division. We actually went out and we're unsuccessful in hiring a construction manager to manage all these projects um, because of the market. You know, currently. Um, we're going to be outsourcing that uh, construction management function. Um, and so the idea is that we're going to be able to deliver on capital projects in the timeline that's presented, you know, and that's been a problem, you know, and so the sheriff has every right to be upset with the timelines on delivering. Um, but, you know, he also knows, and we've been very engaged in fixing that to where these capital projects, but we had to restructure to be able to do that. The way it was currently managed, um, was we weren't able to deliver on that. And so we, we have now we have procedures, we have written documentation on how every capital construction project is managed and the methodology that's determined and then the, the way in which you go about managing a project. So those are, those are policies and procedures and standards that weren't in place just two years ago and now they are. And so now we just gotta get a leader for that group and uh, away we go. And so can I have one more follow-up? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't hear you mention the uh, safety part of it. W one of the reasons I'm so concerned about that facility is because, you know, in the event of a major storm, we'd have an awful lot of equipment out there that would be subject to loss. Mm -hmm. we, we agree, and we're, we're going as quick as we can. Well, and to that point, I was out there yesterday, like I said, and I had that discussion with them. They would move some of that equipment off-site, out of the storm's way, oh, they and bring did? it back afterwards, too. So what we could put inside the building versus what we would move out of the county to get it out of harm's way is part of the strategy for making sure that we don't suffer that kind of loss. Good. Thank you. Commissioner Yeah, I was going to make that comment as well, so uh, thank you for the... For that, and then uh, maybe on on Tuesday, just a just a real brief summary of what we have now as far as helicopters, and what the the picture will be. I mean, I think we've all gone through this, but just for the public's sake, just so they understand that we have a, one and a backup, and 
whatever we have, maybe just a reminder they, they of that. They have four and aircraft, three rotary and one fixed wing. Say that again? They have three helicopters and one fixed wing aircraft. Okay. So again, on Monday. Oh, when we'll we, have it for yeah, Tuesday, perfect. yes, Perfect, and then what we'll have afterwards and what that will look like, much better, much healthier condition, if you will, to have a, a new a new one that's not 31 years old or whatever it is, so yeah, thank that, you. The, that the new one that we'll be purchasing will be a replacement, so yeah, yes, it, won't, yeah. it won't expand the fleet. Right, no, right. I understand. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right, item 23 is a request for public hearing um, on an appeal of a denial of a county doc permit application. I think uh, staff briefed you individually under the current ordinance, which I will recommend at some point we change. We have to come to you to request or to even, you have to grant a public hearing and then then you can hear it. And so um, I, I don't understand why it's in place that way, but it is. And so here is it before you to be heard. This is just a request for the public it's hearing. It's a request for a public hearing. Now we've requested denial and obviously the, the property owner um, disagrees with that, but, the, but we're not even talking about that at this point. It's whether or not you can choose not to hear the case and then therefore they don't have that appeal or you could, but it will change that structure in the future at my recommendation at least, um, because I, I, I think it, it, it's very confusing, but that's what this is, um, does. County attorney reports, county administrator reports, item 26 is uh, our- If I can go oh, back, go I do have Sorry, some, some items to, uh, to talk about under county attorney reports. And let me first answer maybe one of the issues <laughs> that Barry just brought up. That request for a hearing under your water navigation code, it's a remnant from the 1955 special act that created the water navigation authority in the first place. Um, some years ago, that was uh, basically brought into your charter authority. So we do have the authority to change that act now as an ordinance. We have made some changes to it. That old remnant request for a hearing somehow survived <laughs> um, some of the changes that we made, but it is certainly something that we can change at this point. Um, I just wanted to go over quickly under reports. I don't have any items. However, I am going to ask you to take action on one item on Tuesday. Uh, first, I just wanted to mention, I did send you all um, an email, sort of just an overview and update of the litigation that was filed subsequent to action you took at your last county commission meeting. Uh, we did attach uh, pleadings that are available. Of course, those pleadings are all a matter of public record and can be obtained from anybody uh, from the circuit court up there in Leon County. I think it's the second circuit. Don't hold me to that. It's stated in your email. Um, so I just did wanna you know, remind you all folks remind all of you if you hadn't seen it yet that we did send an email yesterday with some basic facts about the litigation um, and encourage you to call me uh, should you have any questions about that litigation. Uh, I did hand out earlier to each of you uh, a request from Bryant Miller Olive that I'm going to ask you to take action on, on your meet, at your meeting on Tuesday. Let me back up just a little bit and say that in my office, as you are all aware and pursuant to Pinellas County Charter, the county attorney's office does represent the Board of County Commissioners as well as the constitutional officers, including the supervisor of elections. And we did have contact from Supervisor Marcus uh, questioning whether or not she may ultimately become involved in this litigation at some point. Uh, as you are aware and as set forth in the email we sent yesterday, Pinellas County did not include the supervisor as a party, but it is not, I, I would say it's not completely unforeseeable that she could be brought into the litigation by some other party to the litigation, not the county. That being the case, she has uh, made some steps to move forward and secure outside counsel in the event that she is brought into the litigation by some party other than Pinellas County. So what I handed out to you all earlier is basically, I'll put it as, as well as I can in layman's terms, uh, it is a request for a conflict waiver from Bryant Miller Olive. Uh, that firm, BMO, serves as bond counsel to Pinellas County, so they do provide legal services to Pinellas County, and that is the reason why they are requesting the conflict waiver. I will say to all of you, the attorneys that you all see in bond counsel, you're, you, Pretty much these days, you usually see Kareem Spratling. Uh, formerly, you know, more often we saw Grace Dunlop. 
it's a different section of the law firm uh, that would be handling this matter. So I will tell you, in my opinion, I had no problem bringing this request to you and recommending that you do approve it. Uh, this just came in late yesterday is the reason for the late, um, late request that you all take action on it. But I do uh, recommend that you all approve that waiver when we get to it on Tuesday. But I did just want to give you some explanatory remarks here today. Questions? All right. The final item is the uh, 20, 2022 federal legislative program. Um, it, it's outlined by category, national flood insurance program, beach nourishment, transportation and infrastructure, and offshore oil drilling. And so pretty much a recap of previous years. All right. Any new business, uh, any commissioner plans on bringing forward on Tuesday? We do not have any Skyway. We do not have any Skyway uh, requests uh, currently, although uh, we learned over the weekend that uh, the state, I assume the state, does light the bridge on their own volition for their own uh, things without talking to us, so I'm not sure exactly how it all works anymore, but um, they did light it up red for uh, Tourism Week, um, as did many local uh, iconic locations go red uh, during that day as well. So, but we did not submit an approval request for that, so. No, we don't, we have, we have requested at least a notification of the calendar uh, so that we would know what was lit up, but no, it, it, it's, it's where there is a conflict in policy of they want us to request everything, but then there's ones that they, I assume, they would make a unilateral decision, which is, it's their bridge. They, they should do it anyway, but we're living under their policy, so. so Mr. Chair, yes, ma'am. Microphone. Oh. Sorry. Microphone. I, yeah. Okay. I was suggesting that it would be nice to make the bridge green because May is uh, me recognized in Mental Health Awareness Month, and the color green is represents mental health, and I did not know that until just very recently. We have a very large focus on mental health in our county, and mental health awareness just seemed appropriate. But I have no idea what the policy is to get that done. Just recommending. Typically, traditionally, an outside organization like NAMI would make that request to uh, probably to the Department of Transportation, and then they would sub it back to the three counties to do the official request. Like that's how it has worked with other organizations that have wanted the bridge lit. Um, but Courtney will work with them. Um, and, and it's interesting you mentioned because that is our first presentation on Tuesday is a proclamation for Mental Health Pro uh, Awareness Month, and we will have representatives from NAMI here on Tuesday. Anything else for the good of the order? No. Nope. All right. We are adjourned. See you Tuesday.